Hello, everyone, and welcome to this virtual workshop on aging. I am Michael Lemicky. I'm the Vice President of Science and Industry Affairs at the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, and I will be your host and moderator for today. And I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your precious schedules to join us. I'm going to open up with a, a few remarks about aging. Uh, hopefully, many of you are familiar with the document already, but aging was really a, a concept that was first conceived of by ARM at a CMC workshop back in December 2017, where uh, numerous ARM members were called uh, an effort in the monoclonal antibody industry known as AMAB, which uh, they felt was instrumental and, and one of the pieces that helped monoclonal antibody manufacture move really from a boutique stage into, into the point where it is today. And arguably, um, we are today with uh, gene therapy vector manufacturer where the monoclonal antibody world was uh, back in the time of AMAB about 15 or 20 years ago. So uh, ARM immediately saw the need to, to move forward with a document like this and began uh, assembling subject matter experts from different ARM companies to develop a case study of process development of an AAV vector uh, this is a hypothetical AAV vector. It's not a, not a real product. Using a, a triple transfection process and an HEK293 cell line. Importantly, using quality by design principles. Um, quality by design, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a systematic approach to development that begins with predefined objectives and emphasizes product and process understanding through the rigorous use of scientific principles and quality risk management. It's sometimes described as beginning with the end in mind. So you start with a, a target product profile or a quality target product profile to describe the quality attributes of your product. You then determine using risk analysis and empirical techniques, which of those quality attributes are critical. And ultimately you determine uh, which process variables have a significant impact on those critical quality attributes. Aging was released uh, just about a year ago now, and we've, uh, in the past year, uh, conducted an educational rollout. This rollout uh, has consisted of a webinar series for ARM members. Uh, hopefully you've seen some of these webinars. They, uh, there are six of them. They're, the recordings of the webinars are posted to our website, so you can view them if you haven't had the chance to uh, see them previously. They covered uh, different chapters in, in aging, and we've received some great feedback about it. So I, I, I think uh, if, if you haven't seen those webinars already, please visit our website and check them out. Uh, we're now culminating and concluding the educational rollout in today's uh, workshop. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about what we're gonna cover today in, in uh, a few slides. Um, the entire aging document is available open source on ARM's website. And again, we have the link here. Uh, don't worry too much about copying these links down right now. We'll make my slides available after the workshop. Uh, but you can, you can download the entire document. It's 225 pages long and really a, really a great resource. Uh, and again, we have uh, the recordings available online for any of you that wish to view them afterwards. I wanted to talk a little bit about the way in which aging is being used and, and who is using aging. So again, we've the six webinars that I told you about have had over 660 ARM member attendees uh, from about uh, 13 or 1400 registrants. We found that a lot of people uh, who register for these webinars uh, do prefer to go back and, and, and look at them afterwards. And I think that's reflected in the number of YouTube views we've seen over 2,800 uh, in total. Uh, and the, the document itself, aging has been viewed over 5,000 times on ARM's website. Anecdotally, I've, I've heard a lot of uh, other things, a lot of good things about the way in which aging is being used. Uh, ARM members and others telling me that they, it's, it's a useful part or a useful augment to training that they conduct for new employees. Uh, I've also heard about uh, aging being used in academic settings. Uh, University College of London in particular is uh, using the case study to support their curricula for their cell and gene therapy master's program. Uh, I, I have a goal uh, this year to really uh, in, engage further some of the academic centers who have cell and gene therapy programs and uh, perhaps 
uh, some some uh, regional locations that are working on vocational training as well uh, to further push uh, aging upstream. I think you know we all know that there are significant gaps in in the workforce for manufacturing for cell and gene therapy, and I think that uh, you know aging can be really plays part in filling those gaps, uh, and, and really should be made available to people as soon as possible so they're aware of uh, these principles early on in their career. I want to talk a little bit about today's workshop. So we really have some excellent speakers for you here today. Uh, we have a, a round table. We'll, we'll talk about everyone's favorite topic, comparability. Uh, we, we got a little bit of feedback um, and, and request to do things a little bit differently today. So we're going to we're going to try a little bit of an experiment, and I think uh, you know, understanding that many people over the past couple of years have uh, attended a lot of virtual events and are maybe suffering from a little bit of webinar and Zoom fatigue. Um, it, it was requested that uh, you know we have a, a, a dynamic roundtable with some Q and A, but also that the the didactic presentations or the, or the the presentations should be in a case study format. So we tried to do that here today with case studies on downstream processing, uh, development of a functional potency assay, uh, and, and also facility design, uh, in addition to uh, a, a presentation on digital strategies for successful tech transfer. Uh, importantly, um, the, the downstream processing topic was covered in aging. We, we didn't get to it in the webinar, so we wanted to make sure that we covered that today. Uh, some of these other topics, though, uh, the the degree of detail that we'll go into today on functional potency assays and facility design were actually not uh, covered in the original aging document. They were out of scope, but uh, you know we did have some requests to cover in, in the workshop today some new topics. So please, uh, well, there'll be a survey afterwards, and I'd, I'd love to hear what people think about the format and uh, and how much you got out of it today. I think turning to what's next. Um, Hopefully you're also aware of ACEL, the sister project to Agene. This is uh, really the same idea, a case study describing the use of quality by design principles. In, in this uh, specific case, the example that we're using is an autologous CAR T therapy. Um, you can look at the chapter and, and titles on the right to get an idea of the scope. Uh, so covering similar topics that we covered in Agene, but also digging into some other areas, um, including ancillary materials, uh, and a, a full chapter on facilities design for the ACEL project. Uh, this, this project is very close to completion. Uh, we, we were targeting having this done actually at, at the end of this month, but we recently became aware of uh, some changes to the European regulations that are taking place in uh, 2023, and we felt like it was really important to include those in the regulatory chapter. So we're uh, doing that now, just wrapping things up and, and putting the document through final layout. And I am confident that it will be done at the end of July. Um, at that point, we will post it on our website, open source, you'll be able to access it. And it will also, uh, we'll also start an educational rollout uh, sometime in an August or September timeframe, uh, consisting of webinars and, uh, and a workshop in a similar fashion to what we did for aging. Few logistical things for today. Uh, we are in a webinar format. There, there will be Q and A sessions. Please use the, the Q and A tab. I'll be monitoring Q and A and chat, uh, but I, I tend to look at the Q and A first. So if you if you really want to have your questions addressed, uh, use that tab. We we will save the questions. So if we don't get to all of them, we'll, we will try to circle back uh, to the questioners later on uh, with answers. We will we will post that information to the member portal. Uh, along with my slides. Uh, in, in some cases where we have been able to get permission, we will uh, post the speaker slides as well. Some of the speakers have asked that if you would like to get slides after uh, the, the workshop that you reach out to them directly so we can make their, their contact information known uh, as well. And with that, I think I will, we will jump right in to the first speaker. So I'd like to introduce Michael Mercalli, who is the Vice President of CMC Purification and Drug Product Sciences at Oxford Biomedica Solutions. 
Michael leads the CMC management for Oxford Biomedical Solutions Partners and the purification and drug product sciences teams. He's held positions in process development throughout his career at Metamune, AstraZeneca, Merrimack Pharmaceuticals, Kodiak Biosciences, and Homology Medicines before joining Oxford Biomedical Solutions. Michael holds a BS in chemical engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and a PhD in biochemical engineering from Tufts University. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Let me uh, get my presentation going. Everything look okay, Mike, on that end? Looks good. All right, excellent. Um, yeah, so before I get started, I just want to thank Mike and um, the rest of the ARN organization for putting on this series and also inviting um, me to give this talk today. Um, to tie this into the aging case study a little bit. So I was a reviewer on the downstream section um, for the aging case study. And um, I, I, I really echo a lot of Mike's comments. I think it's a great document for the field that we kind of have this nice guide that can really um, act as a nice starting point for everyone. So we, only, we all kind of get aligned on how is it that we actually want to develop these really powerful therapeutics. Um, so if you haven't read it yet, I re really encourage you all to read it. And the webinars I also found to be extremely useful as well too. Um, so my presentation today is gonna be something kind of similar to what was talked about in Aging is how we're using a purification step, our anion exchange chromatography step, um, to help kind of look at the product quality that's coming out of different um, changes to the process and everything like that. Um, and then how we can also adjust our anion and exchange that based on um, our product quality desires that we need um, to develop these therapeutics. So um, my title of my talk today is gonna to be utilization of the anion exchange design space to enable um, product characterization and comparability. And as Mike said, I uh, am the vice president, I lead the CMC organization and also the purification and drug product sciences. So um, you may not have heard of us. Um, we are a new company, Oxford Biomedica Solutions. So how our company was formed was, um, it's a joint um, kind of combined company with Oxford Biomedica and Homology Medicines that was formed in 2022. We are an independent LLC where Oxford Biomedica, which is based in the UK owns 80% and Homology Medicines owns 20%. Um, so an easier way to think about this would be is that Homology Medicines technical operations department. So that's construct design through GMP manufacturing and quality. We're now a standalone organization that's providing end-to-end um, -end, um, client development and manufacturing services. And with this um, new organization, we are leveraging um, all the work we did with homology with our full breadth of CMC and manufacturing capabilities and the full team as well. So what you can think about it is we were all product developers and now we're offering those services to anyone else that wants to um, take advantage of them. So what are our capabilities? Uh, we have a plug and play platform process, which we believe is one of the best in the industry. Um, it is commercial ready. We were developing this platform over the past couple of years with the end goal of something that can be run at commercial scale. We have 91,000 square feet um, covering all process development and GMP operations. We have a 130 person team with end-to-end -end AV expertise and experience. So this is from designing your plasmids all the way through releasing your product and putting it on and sending it away to get shipped to the clinical site. We've supported homology with five successful INDs. Um, and then we have made 45 500 liter GMP batches to date and all of them have been successful as well too. Our current capability in manufacturing is three by 500 liter single use bioreactors. We are multi-suite and also multi-product. And we have scaled our reactor to 2,000 liters. Um, and we can quickly add commercial um, GMP um, capability at our uh, site in Oxford, UK. And that site, Oxford, UK, um, is very well known as they were making the uh, AstraZeneca uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So they know exactly what to do. They make commercial products. So what is our platform? It's a fully integrated and proven AAV capability from construct design to clinical delivery. So 
one thing that we've really studied a lot is it's not just the process, it's also how you design the product. And we have really deep knowledge on how you can design the product, even from how you design your plasmids, which then govern how the product is made in order to make really best product that marries well with our platform process. We're, um, with this, we're able to achieve regularly titers um, higher than 1E15 VG per liter in the bioreactor with 50% full out of the bioreactor measured by analytical ultracentrifugation as well. So we've done a really great job in improving um, the productivity and the packaging in the bioreactor. What I'll explain a little bit more today is how we're able to achieve 90% fully intact drug substance from our chromatography purification as well too. We spent a lot of time on that. Um, our analytics team is really the unsung heroes of all this. They are the eyes and ears and the backbone of everything. We could not do our jobs without them. And um, we have very deep and broad analytical capability. We can do full vector profile characterization and process characterization capabilities. And I, I'll go into that a little bit more. We have a lot of fun toys in our, in our group. We have NGS, we have mass spec. Um, and then we also do a lot of bread and butter stuff like SEC and DDPCR. And we have a really experienced team. Um, as I mentioned before, we've had five INDs cleared, 45 successful lots, and we have successfully scaled up the 2000 liter as well. So what is our platform? Um, as I mentioned before, it all starts with construct selection. We really help um, partners um, identify what is the best contract to select. Always let biology help drive the decision, but if we can find something that really works with the platform well and supports the biology, that's the winner that we wanna bring forward. Um, we have deep expertise with engineering plasmids, and um, we then do a HEC-293 cell culture with a single-use bioreactor. We have um, a proprietary transfection technique that works really well in getting these plasmids into the cells. And this is also helping with our titers and our packaging as well too. We then have a harvest step where we lace the cells to get all the AAV. And then we have a two column process where we do affinity purification followed by anion exchange purification as well. Affinity is kind of our capture to clean up a lot of impurities and just get our first stage of purification done. And then anion exchange is where we really focus on removing empty capsids and try to enrich in that full intact vector. And then on the back end, we do final formulation, um, drug product fill finish, um, which we have that capability in house and label and packaging as well too. So our AEX step uh, is something that we're really proud of. Uh, we've spent a lot of time on this um, and it's an isocratic AEX step for any of you um, purification um, minded people, uh, that's a step gradient. So we're really happy we can get that done, not a linear gradient. The big thing, which I think more people will be interested in though is our consistent performance and our high level of purity. Um, so you can see at the figure on the left that we're regularly able to achieve greater than 90% full vector. And this is, I can't say this is just the anion exchange stuff alone. Our um, upstream team has done excellent work in um, improving the packaging efficiency um, through plasma design and through bioreactor operation that can really help us even achieve these levels a lot better and reduce the amount of partials as well too. And you can see this, the consistency that we're having right now. How we've been able to do this with the anion exchange step is through a lot of experimental work. Um, so you can see this nice um, heat map plot that I have here where we're able to dial in how much percent empties we have. And this is something that is a strategic advantage, we think, because um, what we could do is we can go in with maybe a little bit more empty capsids earlier stage just to get a read on safety. And then we have the ability to dial things in and get it tighter if there are any safety risks. Um, or we can just go in very clean and we know how to do that. We know how to operate the step really well. We know how it behaves and we know how it scales up, which you can see in the lower right-hand side, our product quality is scalable between PD and GMP. Um, and that's something that we're also really proud of as well too, because we can develop this in PD, but if it cannot run in our manufacturing setting, it's not a viable step. And we always make sure that anything we do in PD is something that can be executed successfully in manufacturing. Okay. So um, today I'm gonna to talk about a few case studies, short case studies on where we use our anion exchange step. Um, to enhance our product profile characterization and how we've supported comparability. And we feel this will kind of tie in nicely with the roundtable discussion that's happening after uh, the talk today. So our first case study is where we did full analyses of the vector profile and really wanted to understand um, what are partial VGs and 
um, is this something that we need to be going after on the anion exchange stuff as well too, right? And then the second and third are how the AX step really supported comparability. And I'm gonna share something that we did a couple of years ago where um, many companies had to go through this, how we transitioned from ultra centrifugation to anion exchange and how we did that comparability study. And then also I'm gonna share with you something that we're really proud of and excited of is our dual transfection system and how the anion exchange step helps support that um, comparability exercise as well too. So I said, case study one is gonna be our product profile characterization. So this is where we're really looking at the partial VGs. So the question we had is, are partial VGs active? And this has been something of debate uh, in the field. I think there was an, um, an ARM or an FDA webinar a couple of years ago uh, where I think someone was saying that, you know, maybe partials are active, right? Um, so we wanted to know in our hands, um, is this something that we really need to figure out, right? So, um, what we did is we took a research grade test vector that we knew had packaging issues with it to, and we knew that it generated a lot of partials because to do this work, we really needed a lot of partial VGs. And as I showed in the previous slides, um, the work we're doing right now, we really have a good idea on how to control these partial VGs. So if we were going in with something that was 90% fully intact with maybe three to 4% empties, there's not a lot of partials you can play around with, right? And uh, how we knew this had a lot of partials is we identified that there was hairpin loops in the promoter region that were known to cause these partials. Uh, and what we wanted to do here is we took our AX product, right, which was very clean vector. We want to make sure everything was very clean before we did this. Um, and then isolated the partials by ultracentrifugation. And then we wanted to evaluate our potency to see if they were active or not. So what you can see with our anion exchange fractions is that we had a couple fractions that were pretty enriched in partials um, and some fractions that were not so much enriched in partials as well too. Um, but you can see that our product, we had a fair amount of partials there and that's what we kind of used to um, move forward with this workflow. So what we did is we um, did an orthogonal step where we did just a bench scale ultra centrifugation to really try to isolate these partials. And you know, just to remind the audience here, this is not our GMP step. We were using this as more of a PD product understanding study. So generally, we know we had partials with their anion exchange. So we wanna use an orthogonal step um, that we know could separate partials and poles a little bit better potentially. What you can see here is that even then with ultra centrifugation, it was still a challenge to remove all the partials from the fully intact vector. Um, but we went with this uh, fraction called UC partial anyway, because we thought it was generally enriched in partials and we can get a lot of good understanding and good learnings from this as well too. So what you can see here is that we evaluated the potency. We also did an incredible amount of analytical work up here. Uh, where the parcels are also characterized by VP ratio, aggregation, next generation sequencing by PAC bio, immunogenicity, and in vivo potency effects as well too. I'm not gonna share all this data. Um, so my colleague, Aileen McCall Carboni, it, um, we're planning on having mm -hmm. her present at um, ESGCT in October, where she is actually gonna go dive into this case study a lot more and um, kind of show all the work that the team put into this to really understand what it, are these partial capsids, uh, partial vectors, and what, what do they actually do. But you can see here with this just a small snippet of data that our full vector was very potent, 96% relative potency, but our partial vector had diminished potency. And um, there was still some potency there, but we believe that was because of the percent full capsids that were remaining. So it kind of indicated to us that that the partial VGs were not very active. And it was something that um, we probably should not be pursuing um, in a process and claiming as part of the product. So what our work is going on right now is how we're trying to reduce these partials. And what we're doing right now at Oxford Biomedical Solutions is improvements to the construct design, transfection, and also the chromatography development. Those three um, efforts have really helped us to reduce our partials. And that's why I was able to show you all that vector um, that data before where we're getting consistently 90% fully intact vector. So very clean product is what our platform is capable of now. Moving on to case study two, uh, a big one which a lot of organizations have gone through or are going through right now. How do you transition from ultra centrifugation to EX? 
So how we did this is we really leveraged our um, full breadth of analytical methods. And just to show you all the assays that our internal analytical team operates, we have 24 routine methods uh, to test product quality on every GMP lot. Um, we're able to support full stability. And we have also 19 characterization methods. Um, and the characterization methods is really how we learn and get better. You know, the release is really to ensure we have a good, good quality product. The characterization, that's the stuff that's gonna help us learn and move forward and could be future release assays as well. Um, you can see here a list of all the assays that we have and the capability that we have. Um, and then as mentioned before, we also have um, mass spec, um, next generation sequencing by PacBio. And we have a full um, bioassay team that works on relative gene expression and full potency assay development and supplies and supports those that work as well too. So in our opinion, anti exchange, it's really the optimal tool for an AAV purification process. Um, it's scalable, it can deliver comparable product quality, and it's more robust than the ultra centrifugation step as well too. So our original plot process platform, and this was years ago, was pretty common in the industry. We do TFF1, affinity, ultra centrifugation, and then we do a TFF2. We were transitioning a few years ago to um, move to, to anion exchange, and we're like, well, how can we do this? Can our anion exchange deliver the same amount of product quality? And then suddenly just to, um, for the audience, we've now also removed our TFF1 step from our platform, but this case study was a couple of years ago. And we are able to remove our TFF1 step because of our upstream team really increasing the titer that we are able to have our um, affinity step handle direct capture within a reasonable amount of time in the manufacturing facility. So um, as a lot of you may be going through this right now, there's a lot of advantages for anion exchange over ultra centrifugation. It's scalable, it's um, cheaper. You don't have to buy very expensive equipment. Um, it's something that can be automated a lot easier. And we think it's more robust if you understand the design space as well too. So probably saying like, that's great. Show me the data and here's our data. Um, just a snippet of our kind of release data that we use for the comparability exercise that we did show in an IND that was cleared. By SEC, we have comparable product quality where the AX process actually delivers maybe a little bit less aggregates. And we think that's because of the charge um, capability of AX enhancing that removal. Our protein purity is a bit higher than the UC process as well too. And the big one is our percent empty capsids at this time were comparable. Um, our historical range for UC was two to 18%, which is a fairly broad range. We were a little bit tighter on AEX with eight to 15%. Now we're really delivering a lot of processes that are about less than 10% of the capsids, as I showed earlier, you know, just because over time we've been making a lot of good improvements. Another big one was our in vivo potency. Um, we did the in vivo potency and both methods delivered a comparable um, in vivo potency as well too. And another benefit of moving to anion exchange was it was a cleaner product. We were able to remove more host cell protein in the end too. We deliver host cell protein below the limit of quantitation as well, um, which was not the case with the ultra centrifugation process. So um, with all these, the ease of use, the scalability and the robustness, we were able to successfully integrate this into our process platform. And then my last case study today, which I'll be talking about is um, our AX platform design, how it supported our triple to dual plasma comparability. So we've developed a dual transfection system, which is superior to the triple transfection system. Um, we have tested this with seven different constructs. Um, in vivo comparability has been confirmed as well too. With the dual, pla with the dual plasma transfection system, we get significantly higher um, percent fully intact vector package right out of the bioreactor and significantly higher uh, bioreactor um, titer as well too, which then translates to a lot more drug substance and drug product as well. So we, we, it probably be best yeah. for you not to use, but if you do need them, I'll, I'll be able Sorry. Okay. Someone... you mute yourself? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Mike. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, thanks Mike. So our dual transfection system, we believe is, is, is superior to our triple transfection, but we had to get there through a comparability exercise using the NIN exchange step. 
So the AAF step, it really helps select what is our plasma ratio that we want to go for in terms of developing a comparable product quality and also showing how much more VG recovery we're getting. So you can see at the graph at the right, we had different dual plasma ratios. And we, what we wanted to do was show something that was better than a triple plasma. Because to make a change, we're showing something that's not, uh, that's not comparable. It's really not desirable for us. So through the NIN exchange step, we were able to generate a lot of um, very clean product that also showed the key differences between the dual and triple transfection as well too, where you can see the AX step is good at removing empties, but the transfection step actually re really helps us reduce that amount of partials as well too, which is really critical as I showed earlier. The other benefit of the dual plasmid system is through our anion exchange step, we actually get a lot more product um, and we get a lot more intact VGs. So you can see here, we're getting significantly more intact VGs while our amount of partial VGs coming out of the process is about the same through triple transfection. So that ratio of intact to partial is actually better with the dual transfection system. So we, this a, putting everything through the AEX step, um, through the kind of the whole purification process really allowed us to better elucidate than just looking at crude lysate analytics, the real difference between the triple and dual transfection uh, processes. Now we've done this um, several times um, with a couple different products. And here's just a snapshot of some of our 50 liter data, which is kind of our pilot scale. We're showing um, that the dual and triple um, processes are delivering comparable product through the drug substance, so through the NIN exchange. Aggregation, protein purity, percent empty capsids, um, partials and fulls are all fairly comparable with each other, except what we're seeing is we're seeing a bit less partial capsids, and then we're seeing um, less empty capsids with the dual plasmid process as well too. And also a big thing is our relative gene expression, our potency, they're comparable. Same with our in vivo potency, where not only did we look at just um, the amount of a certain protein being expressed, we looked at transduction, mRNA, um, in addition to the protein production. So, and we've also run this at a larger scale at our 500 and 2000 liter scale, and we're able to develop um, very comparable product quality as well too. So just to summarize, um, our ANA exchange step was thoroughly designed with a QBD approach. We wanted to make sure we understood what was the amount of the product profile coming out. And then we designed experiments to ensure we can get that optimal product profile with our main focus being on reducing the amount of empty capsids. Um, we've shown it's effective and robust. It works across many different constructs and has been proven many times at 50 liter, 500 and 2000 liter scale. And we were able to show you today that leveraging our design space, we were able to support several product comparability exercises because you can make these changes, but if your purification process doesn't help deliver a consistent product, you might not be able to make those changes. And that's what I hope you kind of take away with today. Um, and then using the ANI exchange step with the full analytical panel helped develop optimal processes and high purity products. And we really believe here at Oxford Biomedical Solution that we can help the field overcome some of the observed safety challenges by delivering very clean vector and very high quantity. Um, and we really think that can really help um, everyone who's developing these products, you know, kind of progress the field. So just a few acknowledgements, and this is by no means a complete list because this is truly a team effort how we work here. Purification Sciences, um, I was able to get some help and support from Alex Miola, Shan Shan Zhou, and Thomas Tears. And analytical development, as I mentioned before, uh, my colleague Aileen, she's going to be giving a talk more on the partial um, analytical workup at ESGCT this year. So I encourage you all to go to the conference and kind of see all that um, great data. Uh, and Brenda Burnham, who's really been um, helping us build up our AUC expertise so we can really better evaluate these empty partial and fulls. And then um, just a couple of people helped me with the presentation, um, Kelly Casada um, and Tim Kelly. So with that, um, if we're able to give um, copies of the slide deck, um, we encourage you all to contact us, talk. We'd love to talk to people and share what we're doing here and see if we can work with you. Um, our email address you can find right here is solutions.partnering at oxb.com. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And if you want to talk more about how we can work and collaborate together, we'd love to have the conversation with you all. So thank you again for your time. And I'd like to thank Mike and the rest of the organization for giving us this opportunity to talk to you all today. Thank you, Mike. Uh, really fantastic work. And, uh, and thank you again for your work on, uh, on the AG project. I think um, 
we have a poll question that you wanted to ask the audience. So maybe, you know, we have, we have some questions for Q&A in the queue, but maybe before we jump into those, uh, this would be a good time to pop up that poll question. So the question is, uh, what percentage of full are you getting using AEX? For those of you who are uh, using uh, the AEX step as Mike described in the case study. Uh, this is uh, anonymous, so please be honest. And we'll, we'll give uh, 30 seconds or so for everyone to answer this. Nancy, do we have uh, answers? All right, so it looks like uh, kind of kind of a split between fifty to seventy five percent and seventy five to hundred percent using uh, AEX. So, uh, Mike, I think it's great that you showed us today that it's possible to get you know to the to the ninety percent range, and uh, that's something that hope hopefully everyone can uh, can strive for. So um, I guess I, I, I'd like to ask you a question first before I jump into some of the audience Q&A. So, you know, I, I thought the dual transfection system, I actually didn't know about that uh, before, you know, you put together your presentation material. So it's really, really interesting to me. And I, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about it. And in particular, if I'm understanding it right, so you have rep cap and the helper on the same plasmid. And are, are there any challenges associated with that? Or what, you know, what else are you able to say about the, the system right now? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, so we actually presented a poster on that at ASGCT this year. Uh, my colleague, uh, Laura Van Weishout presented that. And we have a patent filed around the system. The key differentiator we think with our dual plasma system compared to others that you just mentioned is that we actually have the GOI and the rep cap on the same plasma and the helper is a separate plasma as well too. And we've definitely noticed, because um, we've tried many different iterations of how we can get that combination to work. And we noticed that one was the most effective in our hands. And that's how we're able to really increase our product quality and also our pro process productivity as well too. And also you just gotta think about it, it's one less plasma you have to make, right? And one less plasma you have to transfect as well too. Right, right. We all know, you know, availability of plasma is definitely, definitely an interest, or uh, uh, sorry, definitely an issue for the, uh, for the entire field. Yeah, we're anticipating that patent to publish later this year, early next year as well too, around that. All right, so I'm gonna uh, go to some of the audience questions. I think we have some good, uh, some good questions here. So um, first question is, were you able to deduce the potency of foals, foals plus partials and partials in the same study? And do, does a mixture of full and partials have the same impact or the same potency as, as fulls? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, so it, um, in the presentation that I showed, we had a very difficult time actually trying to remove the partials from the fulls because they're so similar in so many other properties. The fraction that we did see diminished potency beyond the empties, the empties showed no potency was the partials one where we were about 57% partials to about 43% full. And if you, if you remember from the talk, we got about 43% potency. With our potency assay, anything less than 50% we consider um, not comparable, while the full one came back at 96%. Um, and that was pretty much enriched the full vector. So we think that the decrease in that potency was primarily due to the contaminating partials in that fraction. Um, that's why it caused it to go down. Or the other way to think about it is why we even had potency in that fraction is because we had contaminating foals in that fraction. Right. So oh, I hope that answers your question. Another another question here. Uh, compliment on your on your data on empty capsids. And I get this is referring to the second case study, I believe. Um, yeah. when when you switched from ultracentrification, did you compare the degree of partials? In the, in the two processes. Yeah, we did. Um, we did have that um, data there too. So with that construct, um, we did have comparable levels of partials. 
one thing we did actually notice a little bit of was with this construct, we seem to be removing a little bit more partials to the AEX step, um, but it wasn't so significantly different um, measured by analytical ultracentrification as well too. But thank you for the compliment. And maybe, maybe just a, a, a follow on question that I have. So you, you said with this particular construct, and I know you're just able to show us one case study today, but yeah. have, have you seen variation in, in like the, the, the number of partials, for example, in different, different constructs or when you're using different GOIs? Oh, absolutely. So th that's why I think early on that we've really focused on the contract design and that that's where um, for us working with potential fu future partners, we'd love to help you all in designing these constructs. So then you kind of prevent partial packaging from, from occurring and everything like that. Um, because we believe it really comes up through the um, design of the plasma and how you're transfecting. Purification process can help out a little bit, but as the data showed here, they're so similar in so many of their properties, it is, an, it is a very significant challenge for purification to remove more partials. So we would rather address it at the um, early onset through proper um, construct design. And um, this is kind of a learning we all had. A lot of us used to work in MABs before we switched over to gene therapy, like maybe some of you, where the MAB industry kind of early 2010s, mid 2010s was kind of centering around we have all these challenges with aggregation. That was the main big thing, right? Well, what if we just designed the maps to prevent the aggregation? And that, that was kind of a eureka moment where, you know, the platforms are really high quality. Great. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. So another um, another good question here. You know, you, you showed some really great results from a purity standpoint. And, you know, I think uh, it, obviously it makes a lot of sense in most applications to remove as many of the empties as possible. But um, you also need to make enough vector to, to be able to treat the patients, right? Can, can you talk a little bit about yield and in, in the case study where you were switching from ultracentrification to AEX, uh, did, you see, did you see yield differences? Yeah. So in that specific case study, we did see comparable recovery. Um, I'd rather kind of talk about now what we're capable of now doing, because that was a couple of years ago. With our current platform, um, we're able to generate upwards of 2E17 VGs per 500 liter bioreactor. Another way of thinking about that is we have the capability of making about three liters of drug substance at a concentration of 6013 VG per mil. In our AEX step in our current platform with a well-designed construct, we're able to get about 75 to 80% VG recovery right now. So we really think with our platform starting at the construct design and also leveraging all the effort we put in on the upstream and downstream side, we can really start making these therapeutics more accessible um, and can supply larger patient um, populations with this. So we feel that we're able to help overcome the bottleneck that the field has had the past couple of years with our platform. Thank you, Mike. Yep. Very nice. Um, next question, uh, can you comment on the generation of RCAAV, assuming that's replication competent AAV, and if your improvements had an effect on their frequency? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. And that's something that the agency really likes to ask about. Uh, we have RCAAV as a um, release test now, and um, we have not detected any RCAAV for any lot that we've made, all 45 lots. And our testing. Um, protocol has been approved, approved by the FDA as well through the INDs. So it's really not been an issue for us at all. Okay. I think you already answered this next one, but maybe if you could just reiterate for the double transfection system, uh, where the, is the helper gene on the same plasmid? Or maybe, maybe you could just, uh, I'm going to rephrase the question a little bit. Uh, yeah. Remind everyone which uh, which genes are on which plasmid. Yeah, sure. So we have uh, the helper plasmids by itself, and actually, to add we have our own proprietary AD helper that's off the shelf that we can offer to um, partners because we have spent a lot of work on that AD helper to really help improve that packaging efficiency. And then the other plasmid is the gene of interest with the rep cap. So that's on one plasmid, the gene of interest and the rep cap. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Another uh, question about that platform. Uh, has it gone through an, an IND stage uh, for any clients yet? Or yeah. for oncology? 
So we have we have cleared five INDs and then also moving into the dual transfection, we actually have had interactions with the agency um, where we've agreed upon a comparability plan with them. And we should be supporting that movement to the dual system um, pretty soon for homology as well too. Okay. Uh, number of additional questions about replication competent AAV, but I think you've answered them. I'm just gonna yeah. take a moment to And again, when you, you say you've used that as release RCAAV as release criteria in the dual plasmid. Yeah, uh, yeah, we've tested this in PD extensively as well. Okay. Yep, we've never had any RCAAV. Very, it's a very popular question. <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, some of the agencies pretty hot on right now and understandably so, right, so. Uh, question about uh, the vector size, is it at or above the known packaging capacity and was that investigated as a, as a possible variable or cause for partials? Yeah, so that's a great question. That's something that we're looking at right now. Um, and we have some data on where we know there's definitely an influence of the size which can impact your partials. We've also noticed that's not the only factor. There's other factors such as um, the design of your promoter and your gene of interest. Um, if they're properly designed and the um, cell can replicate them effectively, then you're going to be okay. But as I mentioned before, we found with this one research test vector, we had some hairpin loops in the promoter region that were really causing a lot of significant partial packaging as well too. Got it. Um, another question about uh, the, ex the uh, host expression system. Is it, is it uh, HEK 293? Yeah, so we're in uh, HEK293, yep. Yeah, we, we've shown that, um, we've did, we did studies years ago showing that compared to Bactolo virus, that it um, produced um, a better product that was a cleaner product and also was more effective in our hands in in vivo studies. And I think we presented a poster on that uh, a couple of years ago at ASGCT as well. That's fine. Uh, one question, which may be our, our last question. When you use the term uh, full, yeah. are you referring to a complete ITR to complete ITR? Correct, exactly. Full vector. So just as the way you're designing your vector, that end-to-end, -end, um, that's what we're measuring by analytical ultrasoundification, which we believe is the most accurate technique to determine the difference between empty, partial, and full vectors as well, too. Okay, yeah. Good question. Yes. So I'm going to pause for a moment to see if there's any other questions coming in. I think that is it. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Mike, for that great. Oh, sorry. I was, just when I <laughs> just when I thought. Uh, <laughs> We were going to get you out of here. Um, yeah, this is kind of a general question. Uh, how's the product quality profile at the 2000 liter scale? Yeah, good question. It's comparable. Um, so we've run the 2K several times and we've generated good comparability from two liter all the way up to 2000 liter, even using the anion exchange stuff as well too. Um, and the transfection was actually something we were more concerned about because you're transfecting 2000 liters and we showed no um, adverse events to productivity or product packaging with our the way we operate transfection at the 2,000 liter scale. Okay. It looks like we're, people are getting a second wind on the questions. So. That's fine. <laughs> but we still have time. Um, That's fine. No problem. Can you confirm that the partials have an effect? Do the partials have an effect on the assessment of in vitro potency? Um, so I'm going to defer that question to my colleague, Aileen, who's going to give a talk at ESGCT. I don't want to give away everything right now, but um, her team's done a lot of work on that. So we just wanted to share the in vivo potency at this time. All right. So a little, little teaser there. Yeah. So go to ESGCT and you'll, you'll get no, all the answers. No, no spoiler. Alert. <laughs> that, that overlaps with our Mesa meeting, by the way. So don't everyone go to ESGCT. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Divide and conquer. Um, uh, question from Hannah uh, about serotype differences. Uh, do, you, do you see differences in terms of fulls versus empties versus partials in different AAV serotypes? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So we've tested our platform across many different serotypes. You know, a lot of the big ones, two, eight, um, five, six, seven, one. We've done dual and triple transfection um, with that. And we noticed that um, we're able, our platform works in all of them. We get very high productivity, really great levels of packaging. Um, the, the key difference is, is that we're using a construct that we've designed that we know has limited partial packaging and we don't see a whole lot of partials. So it's not really the serotype, it's really that design of your um, kind of cassette that really influences that partials. And that's, that, that's something that we've spent a lot of time really understanding. And um, we hope to work with people to help them really design those vectors to overcome the partial challenge. Okay. Uh, question about the AX uh, column. Are you able to say what, what kind of matrix you use? Uh, I can't say what kind of matrix it is, but it's an off-the-shelf chromatography resin. So ample supply, very easy to get, um, not custom at all, um, and very straightforward scalability. Um, replication competent AAV again. <laughs> this is a little more specific um, for your for your release test. And again, I'm not sure if you're able to say this, but are, are you are you doing this in house or are you using uh, a CRO? Yeah. And uh, is there a product specific release specification based on a PS uh, qual study? Yeah, so um, I, we do use a CRO. Um, and then I think for any of those other questions, um, feel free to reach out to us. And if you're interested in working with us, we can explain kind of our strategy around our CAV a little bit more. Okay, fair enough. Um, so really digging into the details now. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Do you, do you use uh, proprietary, your own proprietary cell culture media? Uh, no, we use an off-the-shelf cell culture media. Um, and um, so it's something that we're able to get very easily. And uh, we have a uh, vendor partner that makes it as well, too. Great. Yep. Uh, next question is, have you confirmed that the identity of the cargo and the full impartials is comparable in addition to the size by SVAUC? Yeah, I think that's the same as what we run, sedimentation velocity AUC. Right. Yeah. So have you confirmed, I'm just reading on my other screen, the identity of the cargo and full impartials is comparable in addition to size. Yeah, so I think that talk, answer to that question is a little bit more detailed than what I'm willing to share today. But I think if you attend my colleague's talk at ASGCT, she'll uh, talk about that at, more at length. There's a lot more deep analytical characterization that went on to support that work. Yeah, you're gonna to have to send me that presentation afterwards, Mike. It sounds like there's yeah, it's it's going I've seen the data. It's gonna be a great. One. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, question about the the cell line this time. You said it was HEK two nine three. Is it yeah. is it proprietary or or off the shelf? It is an off the shelf cell line. So very easy to get. No supply issues or anything like that too. Right. Yep. Um. Zenobia, could you just clarify the question you just asked? I think that the, the talk that Mike's saying will be at ESGCT. Yeah. Yeah, there will be a talk at ESGCT in Scotland in October. Okay. Um, more analytical data, much more fuller work up on all the partial, the difference between partials, empties, and fulls, and everything like that. So it's going to be a great talk. Um, and then the other talk I did reference was we have a poster at ASGCT earlier this year. Uh, about the dual plasmid system. Okay. I think just one last question, actually from, uh, do you control the expression of your rep cap and gene of interest in your plasmid? Do we control the expression of rep cap and gene of interest in our plasmid? Samir, could you maybe Clarify that a little bit. Uh, yeah, so um, my so I see your point. Uh, I do understand that uh, the DNA structure will play a role. That's really good that you have done deep studies on it. I was wondering that will that affect expression of your independent genes in your rep cap or gene of interest? Um, this is a general question. If it's proprietary, it's all right. Sure. 
Yeah, no, it, it's a good question. I think I understand better now. Um, what really we see right now is just a lot more vector and a lot better package vector with the dual plasma system. Um, we really see a diminishment in parcel, partials. We're seeing the full length vector that is the exact sequence we want ITR to ITR as well too. Um, that's really the benefit of the dual plasma system that we're seeing so far. Okay, then thank you. Yeah, no problem. Well, with that, uh, we will we will wrap up this part of the uh, of the webinar or the workshop. Thank you, Mike, for a great presentation and and being so open with all that data. And and thanks for doing such a great job with the questions. And uh, and thank you once again for for your great work on aging. Great. Thanks a lot, Mike. Appreciate the opportunity. So if I can ask. Uh, the, uh, the participants in our roundtable talk to uh, come on to camera and unmute yourselves. Hey, Mike, it's uh, Paul. And it's not that my camera's not letting me come on. I, I'm, I'm going to go out and come back in again and see if we're going to do that. Okay, we're a little bit early, so we'll, we'll give you a minute. Anybody want to say anything about Paul while he's? Yes, I have a lot to say. <laughs> Privately chatted, please. Yeah. Uh, just bear with us for a few minutes. We'll uh, we'll get started back up in, in a moment. Hey, Paul, welcome back. Hey, guys. Sorry, I'm just moving screen. All right, you look great. Uh, OK, so let's jump in. I'm, I'm going to moderate uh, this roundtable for the next hour or so. So I, I have some questions and, and points to discuss, and but let's keep this as open as possible. Um, and, and we will have some time for some audience Q&A at the end. But first, uh, I'm going to ask the the uh, participants to introduce themselves. Um, I've already introduced myself, but again, uh, Michael Lemicky, I am the Vice President of Science and Industry Affairs at the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, and I will be moderating this discussion. And I'm just going to go across as I as I see you in in the Zoom windows. Uh, Tim, could you uh, introduce yourself first? Sure, Mike. Uh, thanks. Hi, everyone. Tim Kelly, CEO of Oxford Biomedical Solutions and uh, happy to be here talking with you today. Paul? Yeah, hi, uh, Paul McCormick, uh, CTO, uh, Lexio Therapeutics. Uh, we're a New York-based uh, gene therapy company looking at uh, clinical stage, looking at products in, in both CNS and cardiac conditions. And it's uh, great to be on today, and thanks for, for the invitation. Thanks, Paul. And, and thank you uh, for being one of the key contributors and drivers of, of aging. Uh, Kevin, would you like to go next? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, hi, everybody. Kevin Whittlesey. I'm a principal with Dark Horse Consulting, uh, expertise in uh, AAV non-clinical product development and regulatory strategy. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks for being here. And uh, last but certainly not least, Mo. Yes, uh, sorry if I have a bad connection. Mohe Darren, uh, Vice President of Translational and Regulatory Strategy, GC Therapeutic, and um, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. Mo is also the lead in AG for the section on comparability, so he will be answering all of the questions today. I, will, <laughs> I won't put you on the spot too much, but I'll try not to. Um, so to start out and and uh I'll, I'll kind of call you out one by one but i this, this is this first question i'd like everyone to weigh in on so since i've been at arm i think i've seen more webinars or panel discussions um or or written articles on comparability probably than any other topic and in in every single one uh it's always stated that you really need to start 
as early as possible in your development program, thinking about comparability and, and really coming up with a comparability plan. Um, so ra rather than sort of revisiting that again, I'd, I'd like to ask a little bit of a different question though of, uh, of the panelists today. And that is, you know, un understanding that process change is inevitable, it will happen. Uh, why, why don't companies start thinking about or planning for comparability early? But what are the what are the reasons that that are stopping them from doing this? And uh, I think uh, in this case, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with 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 Kevin first, since I see you to, just to uh, just to my right on, on the Zoom screen. Sure. No, it's it's it, it, it's a super important question, and I mean, in 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 my observations and experiences, a lot of it is is resource limitations. Uh, these are often small companies. Um, developing a comparability plan is not a trivial exercise. It's 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 a lot of work. It's a lot of assays and analytics. I mean, we 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 saw very nicely laid out in the last presentation. You can be looking at more than a dozen potential assays and analytics and readouts. And uh, when you're a small company trying to get into the clinic, they tend to be very singularly focused about getting to that first human trial and not allocating the human and equipment and financial resources necessary to, to go down that road. So I think it's it's really a, a it, it, it came up in the, in the last hour of keeping the end goal in mind and understanding where you need to get to and appreciating the fact that it takes an investment to, to, to be able to, to, to think long-term in that way. Um, I will, I will, I, those are my general comments. I'll pass to others. I'm sure there's a lot of thoughts on this one. Tim, can you uh, share your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, certainly I agree with, with Kevin's comments. That makes complete sense. Everyone has to make priorities, right? You have to decide what to do with your resources and with your, your funds, right? And that, uh, that means some are going to be limited for sure. Um, the other thing I would say, though, is, you know, I, I would kind of rephrase the question of, what, you know, why don't people uh, prepare for comparability early on? The way we look at it, um, is how can we avoid or minimize, diminish the risk of what we think we're going to have to do for comparability, right? And that means investing early, which comes with the same prioritization issues. But if you invest early, I think you're going to get to your end game faster, right? You may not get to your first IND or your first talks, you know, in the world's fastest time, but you may get to your end game, which hopefully for all of us is actually, you know, getting good therapies, safe therapies into humans that will uh, help them and cure their diseases, right? And, and get that, you know, going more rapidly. So, but it, it comes down to prioritization, I would say. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Mo, uh, what, what, do you, what do you have to add on this, on this topic? Um, yeah, I mean, the, bottom line is like 10 years ago fda really it was at the early stages of uh, of development of some of these products so there wasn't a lot of conversation around comparability process change because uh, obviously you had to set the best uh, base stage in the development um and i'm i apologize for the background noise but uh, but you know the, the agency's uh, position has evolved uh, with more understanding of CQA CPPs. The more um, products being developed in the space, the the expectation has risen, and, and therefore comparability becomes uh, a center stage today. So in other words, you have to do it. <laughs> you have to think about it earlier, whether or not whether or not you want to. Uh, uh, Paul, I'm sure you have something to say about this. Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, my uh, fellow panelists have, 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 have you know answered a lot of this. I, I, I suppose one of the ways to think about it is the evolution of the industry. You know, where the initial medicines that are in the clinic came from. You know, but for the the great academic centers that have worked in this space, we wouldn't have a lot of these medicines, right? Now, um, I, I think you know what 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 you then do is you get more laboratory-based manufacturing processes that can get you into the clinic. I think we've seen a huge, you know, revolution. I, I, I think in the last few years in, in both the, the way to look at these products, but also the way to make them, right? I think the last talk from 
the folks at, at Oxford Biomedica and you know before that homology you know had shown that a lot of companies are now doing the work to do that right I, I, I think you know if you're starting now I mean the ideal situation as Tim said is try and get in with a process that you can you, you can scale that's scalable that delivers enough factor that manages it through the life cycle right because you know it is a huge effort as people have said to say do like do the changes on the downstream from ultra centrifugation to to chromatography right the whole profile of the product will you know change in terms of the residuals hopefully improved but but there's a huge effort associated with doing that so my, my, my sense is, is that more com companies are now doing that and they're trying to you know by the time they're doing discovery they're trying to set up you know processes that will deliver sufficient vector to make a large regtox batch and that process will be representative of what they want to put into the clinic but there still is you know residual processes where you you have to do the work and i i don't think there's an option not to you know so you made a great point about the academic centers um do you do you think they're getting as the industry is evolving are they getting better at understanding the importance of being able to scale up or is there a role that that industry and we or that arm can play in, in helping them to learn more about that no i really think they are you know it, it's it's you know the, you know i i think someone had sent to me from an academic center that asgct is now evolving to a much more company-based forum as opposed to what it was five years ago for instance so I mean, you know, I, th I think there's a there's a room in the ecosystem, you know, and there is certain medicines that people are not developing products for. So, so there's, there, there is room for, for the academic centers as well. A lot more of these centers are becoming much more exposed to companies. A lot of them are setting up companies, frankly, um, it's where we come from. So, 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 so I, I think you're you're seeing, you know, the evolution of of process and products. You're seeing people that have worked in many years in, in biological product production now getting involved in this space and the fruit of those entrances has raised you know the boats are all rising for everybody I, I think I don't know if anyone else has a offer a comment on that but you know we've been making biologics for a long time you know a lot of those skills can now be applied to to AABs which are complicated but they're still you know, they've got recombinant proteins and they've got nucleic acids and we have to measure quality and we've got ways of making those. So that, so I'm definitely seeing that now. So. Yeah, if I could yeah. add quickly to that, Paul. I, I agree with you. And one thing that, that I would add that might help, especially some of these early stage companies set themselves up for success is where it's a situation. And I've, I've seen this many times um, where there's a sponsored research agreement with an academic entity ask some specific questions about the manufacturing process that's being used and where the material is coming from and how it's being made and ensure that's being done. Obviously it's still in, in an academic core facility or wherever it's being made, but ensure that process is one that is, is fundamentally scalable and, and sets you up for success in terms of not having to start over and re-engineer a process once you once you pull that that product in, into into the industrial setting. Um, I think that's something that often gets overlooked and I think would be important. Good point. Great point. So it, um, maybe another another nuance here that I was thinking of, uh, Kevin and Tim. I think in answer to the question you know why don't companies start early or or what what does it require to start early you both use the term investment and um you know a thing that i've heard is that one of the problems is investors uh want people to get into the clinic as fast as possible and that's kind of where their focus is and and not necessarily on investment in process development and manufacturing but but i, I started to hear more uh investment bankers talk about manufacturing, uh, totally. not, not surprisingly, based on the issues that we've had. Do, does this group think, are they starting to learn? Is that is that pressure starting to, to change from the investment community? Yeah, I, I would um, I, I would say yes. It, it, investors understand um, where the bottlenecks are, where the issues are, and, uh, and realize that they need to be addressed. Um, and, and I think there's a good example of that is, you know, how many companies uh, have 
taken some of their investors' money and built their own labs and manufacturing capability. That kind of is proof, proof is in the pudding, right? Um, that being said, I think to be fair, investors also want both. They want you to do that because they recognize the risk, but they also want you to go really fast. And so inherently it comes back to some of those gives and takes, right? And so um, you, you have to be able to manage both, frankly, which is really why we initially focused on having this platform capability, knowing that you had to be able to move quick, but you have to be able to move quick with the right product quality. So there's a balance there. Right. So I think with that, I'll, I'll move on to a different uh, question. So the, the title of this round table referred to the, the various stages of development, comparability and the various stages of development. So um, I, I wanted to ask, uh, and really I'll, I'll come, to, come to each of you in turn, do comparability study considerations change from early stage to late stage, and, and, and if so, how? And uh, Mo, I see, that, I see that you were on the move, but uh, oh, I lost you again. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, what I talked about in the, the chapter is really this phase based approach and that applies with to the stringency and requirement for comparability. Um, you know, the earlier you make these changes, um, obviously the impact on product quality and the risk is lower versus late phase uh, and so forth. And um, that is in view of uh, our limited knowledge of um, CQAs, CPPs, and and what needs to be measured from perspective of product quality. Um, so, you know, um, the agency's expectation for early phase uh, process changes are, are different than if you, for example, propose to make changes prior to pivotal studies or in between pivotal studies or or even uh, after pivotal studies, some people may propose to do. And, and so um, it, there has to be a realization um, that uh, there is some risk and the risk essentially uh, increases, which is phase-based. And, um, and that therefore that's why you need to make changes early on as much as possible. Um, to uh, mitigate your risk. Right, so it's really really about risk in your view. And that, I think that echoes what Tim was saying earlier about thinking about things you can do to re reduce the risks that come with changes is early on when you're, when you're first getting started with your platforms. Uh, Paul, can I ask you to, to comment on, on this? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, what, what, I th what I think is that, and I think the, the point is there, you need more stringent acceptance criteria for comparability later on, but I don't think necessary. I think I think we have the capability of you know a set of you know both characterization and QC um, assays and also understanding of process inputs that we can do that type of assessment early. I what I do think is you get less flexibility. I think as you as you go on through through development. So it's better to have, you know, the what I would say the analytical kitchen sink at your early stage product, right? Because at least it gives you a set of what you got to hit as you make process changes. Because I think the worst thing is, you know, if you don't look for something, you won't find it, right? You know, and I and I think the more we, you know, anyone's got on in, in this sort of space is is you know using use of a large number of orthogonal methods you can get a real sense of the quality envelope of your product right and from there that you know that of what you're going to need to do comparability from and that can guide your process development that can guide you know the where you know where you turn the knobs on the inputs to understand what the outputs are going to be you know, classic you know process parameters and uh inputs and quality attributes process you know uh, uh critical quality attributes etc so so i think applying these techniques early and keeping material from early development all the way through gives you an ability to say i need to hit this for comparability great so invest in analytics early as well yeah uh tim what, what do you have to add yeah simply that uh it depends on the change 
Right. Certainly yeah. when you're in phase one or preclinical, the comparability requirements are going to be less than when you're in pivotal or even commercial. Um, I think that I, I think I could, that probably goes without saying. But really, the question is, what are you changing and what is the potential impact of that? Um, and do you understand that? Right. That, that, so that's the big issue um, that I would say where we focus on. Um, change is going to happen. Improvements are going to happen. We have to continue to improve in this space for sure. Um, but understanding what you're manipulating, what you're trying to change, and what the what the potential issue might change is is more important, I think. Great. Well put. And and finally, Kevin, I'm sure Dark Horse has had clients that have had to deal with this question at different stages. So what 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 are you able to say about that? And what what are your observations? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, I think a lot of the key points have been touched on. I mean, the, the in general, I'm, I'm, I, I agree with the point that you know, certainly the risk with respect to early versus late stage changes. The uh, overall, the considerations I think are similar, and the key thing that's different is the amount of information that you're working with. Um, obviously, at, at later stage, you have a lot more experience. You have a lot more in the way of batch records. You have a lot more in the way of data. You presumably, hopefully, have a much more robust assay profile. You probably have re have release assays as well as information only assays, which um, which 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 can be leveraged. Um, and and it's really a matter of how you're how you're utilizing those and what information that that, that you're looking at to, to to develop that comparability plan. Um, but the, the the general strategy, I think, I think would would be similar, and we've seen that. It's really um, exactly as, as Tim nicely said. It, it really depends upon what is the change and 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 what and what the impl potential implications on safety are going to be, and and how you're how you're going to demonstrate that leveraging the the assays and information available. Got it. Got it. And just uh, the, the Paul kind of looking at the audience chatter. People love the term analytical kitchen sink. Uh, so the audience knows Paul McCormick has copyright on analytical kitchen sink. So if you're using that term, please, please give full credit. <laughs> All right. I've been using it for a while, but uh, you know, I haven't trademarked it. So if someone else wants it, they can have it. All right. Well, for the, <laughs> <laughs> I got an attorney you should talk to. You should, you should trademark mm -hmm. that for sure. Um, so I'm, I'm going to move on. Um, we have a, a, you know, what I think is going to be a, a great, and informative presentation from Forge Biologics this afternoon on development of a functional potency assay. And, and Paul, maybe I'll, I'll ask you this first. Can you comment on the importance of having an assay or assays like that when you're uh, attempting to establish uh, comparability? I think it's key. And, and being able to, you know, what we're definitely seeing now is is the expectation is, is that at a minimum, you've got some sort of cell-based expression assay uh, in your package when you file your IND. So you've some way of demonstrating, you know, in a me measurable way that your AAV does what it's supposed to do, it infects cells and you could measure the protein that's expressed. So, you, so, so, it, so it does the, the, the infection event, translation event and then the expression of, 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 of the protein of interest. And you have some way of measuring that, you know, in, in, you know, and qualifying that for your IND, right? People, I think previously before this did that, I, I think what, what's a bigger issue is, is and, and I think that's really useful to look at materials that you've had through development to try and understand how that evolves. And, and, and without a shadow of a doubt, you know, I mean, there's lots of, um, you know, stuff on about people's various expression systems and, you know, people using Bacalow versus people using HEK, you know, potency is more than just the cell line you use to create the product, right? It's the total process, right? In terms of recovery, you know, purification downstream, et cetera, all input to the quality of that final product, right? right so having it. Yeah, yeah. Morning, right? Yeah, yeah, having a cell-based assay gives you an ability to measure those things, but you know, it's not in isolation, you know, all those other quality tests as well to give you the total picture of the product, right? And I do think the bigger challenge will be, you know, and the expectations of having, you know, a functional MOA potency assay by the time you start phase three. And you need to start that work, 
that's almost, you know, if you talk of all the at-risk investments people need to make while they're in their first human study, I think it's to start that work as soon as possible and have people in your organization with the expertise to do that. Because you need to understand what your medicine's doing, how it's doing it. And, and you know, some of the products we're, we're producing, we're using, you know, truncated genes. So we're not even producing a wild type protein, we're producing different proteins. And we've got to show that protein does what it's supposed to do in terms of the desired effect. And we have an assay that we can measure that too. So people should not underestimate the effort involved to do that big and small companies, because I think that's tripped up some people on starting their phase three. Uh, yeah, for sure. There's, there's a number of, uh, of really good, or depending on how you look at it, really bad uh, examples of that in the field, unfortunately. Uh, Tim, uh, can, can you add to uh, Paul's, Paul's comments? Yeah, so uh, as usual, Paul threw the kitchen sink at it and it's all, it's all good. So, uh, but the only thing I would, the only thing I would add is, yeah, you, you have to invest early in a full potency assay and you have to leverage your potency assays, gene expression, infectivity, whatever you have along the process of comparability and changing. But you have to also make sure those assays are, are appropriate and good, right? Having, having a yeah. functional uh, potency assay, but it's not that accurate, you know, okay, great. Then it, does it really give you, uh, can, can you really differentiate something that's different, right? Um, so, and it takes a lot of effort, as Paul said, you got to start early. It's not, hey, I got to better start two or three months ahead of time. It's years ahead of when you think you're going to need it, that you need to be investing in this, right? Um, uh, yeah, and, and I, I would add a lot of it, you know, this is, if you look out at the CROs, right, the, you know, the contract labs that do this type of work, this is the thing that has the longest wait list, right? So, um you know, there's some ways, probably, if you know you have to do an expression assay first, I would say to people, you know, you, you can probably say, okay, I'm going to have to, you will end up keeping that expression assay through development. I think there's no doubt whatsoever. But it doesn't need to be the cell line that you ultimately use for your potency afterwards, you know. So, so you, you may choose to say, I'll develop a functional expression assay, which, which the Europeans really, really like, uh, and then in parallel do the development on your functional potency. I mean, I'm definitely, you know, we're doing that type of thing now as well. So we at least have something coming out the door. I think Tim said it's very important. I mean, there's a lot of people that do in vivo based potency assessments. They tend to be, precision and accuracy is a lot more difficult in in, in vivo based potency assays, you know, because you don't get the benefit of, of you know, you know, 96 well play formats where you can do replicates, you can also, you know, numerically power the assay as you do the assessment, which, which, I, which I think, you know, means, you know, it's it's the investment of doing that. But and also, as I said, you know, the labs are full, so, you know, you might need to hire people in house that can do this. So maybe, maybe just a, a follow on question to that. So I think you both talked about, you know, a matrix approach to assays, but also that. Uh, assays and the way you the way you execute them may change over time uh you may abandon an assay if it turns out not to be relevant uh i want to be a little bit careful with this because we have some fda attendees but do you, i've heard fda talk about this do you think they're receptive of this and if, if you have an assay that uh it, it turns out not not to be meaningful is it is it challenging to uh to get the agency to understand that you have to abandon it yeah, maybe so. I'll I'll start on this one. I I, I would say, look, um, I think as time goes on, every, we're all evolving. The industry, uh, academia, FDA, everyone uh, needs to evolve and should be evolving. So I think this will change. I think my recent, my more recent experience, more directly with regulatory agencies is that they're not very open right now to dropping an old method. Uh, even when you share data that demonstrates, hey, we have a better one, it doesn't make sense. Uh, I think the general feeling now is great, let's just do more testing, throw it all in, right? Let's, let's go for the kitchen sink, let's do every single method, because um, there's some anxiety, right? We all know that. Um, I think those things will go away over time as, as we all improve and as our characterization improves. Uh, my expectation is that we're going to start to put better uh, IND uh, and 
uh, IND amendment packages together that really demonstrate we've got better methods, better assays, and better control of our process, and therefore give comfort to regulatory agencies to, to allow us to stop doing wasteful exercises and focus on where the real value add is. Right, but we're not there yet. We're going to yeah, get there. We're all, we're all learning, as you said. Good. Um, I, I, I would add, you know, and I think that that, that that one of the issues is the number of lots people might have made, even by the time they file. Right. I think you know processes are getting more efficient, where a lot of people can run their first human study on a single bioreactor run. Right. Then, you know, the way gene therapy works is you're in first and human, then you're in a registration study. So you may, you may have a very small number of lots. So I think that's why there's a sort of an angst about dropping assays, but you know, we're gonna get these products to market. We're gonna be running um, uh, uh, con you know, continued process verification studies as we've done with other biologics. And then you can make an argument of, you know, if one assay tracks against another, you can make an argument in, in the, you know, in the phase four space, right? And um, what I mean that is the, the last stage, you know, stage three, I should say, of, of, of process validation that you could drop assays. So I, I think once we get these products commercial, remember a lot of these assays, you're gonna have to globally deploy them. So having a very complicated potency framework, you know, you're gonna to need to put it into a QC lab somewhere, right? And it won't just be in the United States, right? So you should think about that as well. Right, great. yeah, great point. And another, you know, key comparability question as you know, are your analytics the same, you know, wherever, wherever you put them down, so to speak. Uh, Kevin or Mo, do you have anything to add on, on this topic before we, before we move um, on? No, I, I, think it's, I think it's been well covered. I mean, I would just emphasize the, the, um, uh, the point that was already made that potency assays are, the, the expectation of a, full, of a full functional potency assay is definitely moving earlier and earlier. I mean, the FDA, especially since a lot of these gene therapies are in rare diseases, the FDA has you know, uh, issued guidance to consider your early phase trials as potentially registrational. Um, so we definitely are seeing a, a shift of the expectation of potency assay moving earlier. So, uh, so, so, so starting on that true functional pot potency assay early on is going to be really important for success. Great. Yeah, I would also, I mean, I agree with everybody what they mentioned about potency. Uh, it, it, our process knowledge and product knowledge is cumulative, right? So um, as, as the programs to evolve, uh, you know, using different uh, methodology, looking at uh, critical attributes, potency is probably the most important. Um, and in context of comparability, it's not about one assay, but again, as you mentioned, it's a matrix of assays, some of which are characterization assays that really look at biological activity. So that, that approach, uh, it's really favored by FDA. They want to see the more, the more assays, the better in order to correlate and find out what is critical, what, what is actually um, uh, measures the quality, the critical quality attribute of product as defined by the, by its potent potency, and um, and and so um, as you change methods, um, you have to keep in mind that when you change methods, they want you to actually compare um, uh, product manufacture after change with your this historical data at minimum, and also with retain um, that you have reserved on the batches that, that you have manufactured already and using methods that are qualified and are phase appropriate. So uh, I think potency is the most critical aspect of comparability. So I agree with um, what is mentioned. Yeah, great, great points, Mo, and um, great point about retains. We'll come back to that a little bit later, but uh, I want to move on to another question now about scale down models. Um, these are these are described and the use of scale down models uh, in, in process development are described in the uh, aging case study. And my, my question is, can uh, can the panel comment on the importance of these models and, and what are some of the challenges that are associated with the use of uh, scale down models? And I think I'll, I'll start with Tim on this one. Yeah, so um, I, I 
I think they're uh, hugely valuable and I think they're going to be needed as, for the industry to progress and go forward, especially as more products get to BLA and commercialization uh, space, which uh, hopefully is, is, is happening now. Um, so I would definitely say invest in this uh, direction for sure. We have done a lot of that, right? We, we have a two, a two liter scale down model that we've now linearly compared up to through our 2000 liter scale. Um, the challenges are uh, primarily uh, what we all know, transfection, if you're using a transfection system. And so you have to characterize and understand your transfection um, and that takes a lot of energy and a lot of effort, just like starting early on a, on a full potency method takes a lot of, uh, a lot of energy and a lot of effort. Um, but if you don't do it, is it going to prevent you from progressing to a pivotal or progressing to your BLA or MAA? Um, most likely, uh, it is, or it's going to make it a much more difficult process for you. So, um, so I would just say invest heavily, uh, early in getting a scale down model or work with someone who has that capability um, so you can avoid doing a lot of that work. Um, but it's really important. And for, for, for this space, transfection is, is probably the, the, the number one area to focus on. Got it. Paul, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think if you, if you think back to the, and I've been sort of doing science of scale for, 20 years um when they originally announced their sort of the the original guidances on quality by design etc really you know emphasized you know what i would call the science of scale and i think tim hit it on the head right in the you know the monoclonal antibody business or recombinant protein business a lot of the unit operations that we deal with here people have spent the time and built models and you can essentially buy them off the shelf right i think the, the difference here is is that where you know and I think Tim said it is 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 if you're doing you know transfection based uh, uh, upstream you need to think strongly about being able to model that and and the other thing I think if if you spend the time and do the work you know and I think it's a combination of both you know biological knowledge but also you know process engineering I th I think you can get there a number of people have done that successfully I think Tim is obviously They've just shown that they can do that and, and it's incredibly valuable because the other thing it gives you with a good scale down model is gives you those ends that you mightn't get in production batches right so it powers your yeah. understanding yeah. of, of your earlier about what, not what's, what's, yeah. what's process variability right? right you know because you you know and, and and you can build not you know you can build you know you know batch to batch variation information you can use your potency assay on a large number of two liter runs you can use it for your qvd work, you know for your for your qvd work which is the you know characterizing your critical process parameters you know that all can go into your submission and right. give you that great knowledge that you understand your product right so 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 it's you know av is not special you, you can do it for av as well i think i think i don't know tim i think you'd agree with that well, you need to spend the time doing it. You, there's no special pass because you're making AV. You know. Yeah, I, I really like that point that it, you know, you can use scale down models to look at more variables and you know conducts potentially you know complex design of experiments without without going broke. Um, it's a great point. Kept uh, Kevin, anything to anything to add? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think some great points have been made. Um, totally agree. With, obviously, it, it enables you to look at multiple parameters much more efficiently. And then the sort of, you know, more generalized comment that's our, that, was, that was nicely touched on uh, by Tim regarding transfection is you need to make sure that, it, that the scale down model is appropriately representative of your at scale process. And that goes from the, from the beginning, from how your cell line is behaving all the way through your, your process intermediates and your, and your final drug product. So, and, and that takes work, um, but, but, but you do need to make sure that it's the appropriate representative of, of what you're trying to model. That's the key thing, I think. Okay. Thank you. Um, so moving on uh, and, and this next uh, one, I want to ask, Mo first, and Mo, you, you mentioned retains, I think, in your last answer. Can you go into a little more detail 
on the importance of retains and, and possibly reference materials as well? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, having retains, I, I think, uh, is actually very critical for establishing comparability as you make process changes. Uh, you have to demonstrate that the product after change is similar to the product manufactured before that change and the retains um, become very important um, rep uh, representation of, of the product before changes. And um, of course, you know, that goes along with the um, concept that the, your retain has to have de some demonstrated stability as well. So um, it, it's not only to have the retain, but also um, to make sure that you have sufficient data that um, that the uh, the product is um, stored and in a condition that retains its activity, etc., by um, conducting appropriate stability studies. Um, so, uh, but bottom line, at the end of the day, in AV field, the batches are very small um, as far as the numbers are, are concerned. Um, so you're confronted with a um, few lots that you manufactured before changes and few lots after. And that, that is the most critical aspect of establishing comparability in, in the field of AV manufacturing. So maybe we can touch upon that later. But um, it, really, um, you can use some of the historical data, but the agency really is focused on the retain and the need for reference material um, in order to establish um, comparability. Uh, Kevin, uh, do, you have, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I, that and that is, I mean, especially for you know more more uh, academically derived groups. Uh, sometimes that's something that's often overlooked. I mean, I definitely always urge. Uh, maintaining retains at, at least from your GLP tox lot um, and, and and subsequently. Uh, I mean, of course, then I know this came up in our, our preliminary discussion. Uh, one of the challenges there then is, is what you do there in terms of stability of your product if you're talking about multiple years and, and whether or not those those retains are going to be part of your comparability program. And, 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 and that I think there's an opportunity there to connect that to, to your stability program and, and, and be, be collecting additional data as you go. But certainly it, it absolutely is important as you move down the road to, to, to have the, those, those reference points for, for comparison to understand where you started and, and, and where you get to and, and what those products necessarily look like. So let me add, you, but you both talked about stability and stability of the retains. How how long do you keep retains? And is there a point at which you should not be keeping them anymore? I mean, I'm a little bit of a pack rat, and I say you don't throw anything away. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, your, your your point's well taken. If you have if it's three years separated from your GLP talks versus your 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 phase one two readout, and you're moving into a more of a commercial process. And you only have 18 months of stability on your product, um, then uh, then then there there certainly is is a potential issue there in terms of how useful an uh, analysis of the retains of that GOP tox material would be. Um, that can potentially be offset by at that point you would presumably have clinical experience. Um, so so may, maybe the importance of the of comparison against that GOP tox material becomes less relevant. Uh, but um, but but how, how how those things fit together in sequencing of the stability program and and how quickly that's advancing and how much data you get on the stability of your product uh, may offset some of the, the 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 older retains. But but certainly keeping them for for reference purposes as you get down the road always better to have than 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 wish you had them. Yeah, was, uh, just so. Uh... In practical sense, I I always realize that it's hard to have uh, ongoing stability on every batches you manufactured or retains that you have. Um, it is very challenging. I understand it in, in practicality sense, etc. That's why, like, uh, if you see uh, stability is, has become uh, more of a focus from FDA perspective, uh, for several reasons, is like. Now, sometimes there is not even a 
limited in information and stability long term uh, that is available. That that's critical to have. Um, I'm not saying for every lot you have to have long term stability, but you have to have a sense of uh, uh, of how stable your product is under condition that is stored. And for for short term, long term. And you have to have some kind of ongoing stability studies. Um, that is at minimum that should be required. Um, now, uh, obviously, it's not practical to have stability for every lot you manufacture. Yeah, I was just I was just going to add. I I may be a little more of a contrarian on the uh, uh, keep samples of everything, uh, but I think Mo and Kevin hit the key point is. If you're looking to use older samples that are beyond the shelf life that you've already demonstrated for comparability or comparison purposes, I, I think that's probably getting you bad information. Um, so that 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 would be my big caution to this. Um, and batches that are a couple of years old, you got to make sure that the samples were handled appropriately and stored in an appropriate um, container and condition, otherwise, again, you're getting bad data. Um, and it might be you run it on a new assay and it looks bad, but it looks bad because your sample container was not appropriate and not representative of your GMP container. Uh, so it may, be, it may be giving you uh, bogus bad data. Um, I think there's, a, there's an element of fool's gold in keeping these retains forever and then trying to use them um, Often we will actually run batches in our scale down model for sure all the time, but even at larger scale, head to head, old process, new process, and run them on the, on the identical analytics on the same plates uh, with the same uh, uh, QC analysts to really understand and be absolutely sure we're, we're hitting this um, right on the head. Thanks, Tim. I, I, I just have to say, uh, you know, all, all of the talk about stability and storage conditions has has me a little bit concerned about the uh, frozen hamburgers in the bottom of my freezer that I was planning on serving the guests this weekend on the fourth. So I may have to I may have to rethink that. I, I was going to say, Mike, you know, you need stability indicating methods, right? That, that's kind of the one on one, right? So again, this is not there's no pass because you're doing A and B. You need to do you know some stress studies and understand the capability of your methods to tell you about the stability of your product, right? Your, your, your product is a combination of a pretty complicated protein and a nucleic acid, right? And you need to have methods that give you some indication, you know, in your, you know, primary packaging container, you know, at the, you know, stored temperature and other temperatures, what, what that material looks like over time, right? So well, I usually bet to do as much stability as you can. So you, you understand that, but, if you're not using stability indicating methods, then you know that's again a fool's errand, right? So, so, so those so simple studies are important, you know. What's the what's the best stability indicating method for a frozen hamburger? Well, maybe we could talk about that offline. <laughs> um, test test well, them on your guests, Michael. Yeah, in vivo. <laughs> a more important question is what's the potency assay? Yeah. Okay. Well, you've given me something to think about. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, ask. One more thing, and then I do want to get to, uh, we do have some questions from the audience. Uh, Mo, if I can come to you first, uh, are there important differences in the approach to comparability between uh, FDA and, and uh, EMA's approach that the participants today should be aware of? Um, I don't think generally there are different approaches. I mean, uh, really the, I think um, there are some slight differences uh, between the two regulatory authorities, but uh, uh, the expectation in this area is evolving, uh, generally speaking. I mean, um, there was less emphasis on CQA, CPP and F from FDA perspective 10 years ago. Now there is more, there is more emphasis on potency. And the reason for that is that these are things that are required from comparability study and the agency recognizes that the process changes really happens all the time. And therefore, uh, the 
therefore why we talk about it all the time. Uh, so, so there are some slight, I mean, uh, PMA also uh, publish uh, guidance or Q&A on comparability, uh, but basically reflects what is discussed in aging approach or, um, or some of the um, presentation by FDA regarding comparability. I haven't published the guidance yet, but um, they've been talking about it. I was at FDA uh, yeah. and I talked about it quite extensively and the principles have not changed. There's no differences in, from my perspective um, um, between the two ag agencies. That's a good, good point though. We do have that uh, Q&A from EMA and I, I believe um, FDA's draft guidance is on, on the guidance agenda for this year. So uh, no, no pressure on our, our agency friends who may be listening in, but uh, th definitely anxiously awaited by, by, by the field. Uh, Kevin, Kevin, anything you wanted to add there about differences or you know something about the EMA approach that uh, that we didn't touch on? Um, I, no, I mean from, from from my perspective, I I, I think Mo Mo you know uh, touched on it nicely, um, and then yeah, I mean I, exactly as you as you point out, I I I think that the the guidance that we all saw on the agenda for this year is going to be uh, important and instructive that that we're that we're all looking to see. Great. So it with that, I think, uh, it won't be a surprise, though. Uh, it won't be a surprise. It, it'd be like uh, like other guidance document that FDA published uh, in this area. Uh, it would just reemphasize same principles. I, I I don't think you're gonna have something revolutionary that you would see in these new guidance documents. So, um, all right. So most promising those surprises. <laughs> I'd like your. Uh, I like your ambition. Uh, so I'm going to move on uh, to a few questions from the audience in the time that we have left. Uh, so this one, um, I'm not sure if you guys will feel comfortable with this. It could, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough one, but I'm going to ask it. So Adrian talked about uh, different statistical methods that could be used in a comparability exercise. Uh, could you share what factors to consider when choosing a statistical method um, and, and any experiences you have there? And, and then a follow-up is, um, should we as a community be doing more to harmonize statistical methods for demonstrating comparability? Bo, I saw, I think I saw you. Yeah, I, I can like stab at it. Uh, I'm not a, uh, uh, expert in that area, but with, in aging, we have a chapter on statistics. And uh, I think that I recommend everybody to take a look at that. But uh, the bottom line is uh, process changes, the batch number, lot numbers are very small. Uh, if you compare it to biologics and monoclonal, uh, the number of batches we're dealing with are much smaller. So it becomes harder statistically to show uh, if a uh, process has not changed the product attributes using limited uh, sample number. But um, FDA has been uh, like uh, interested in um, seeing the different method and coming up uh, to see what, how, how companies and sponsors rationalize using one method versus the other. And they, from my perspective, they favor a two-tailed t-test toast as a way of uh, comparing um, two samples. And, um, but, but they're really interested in knowing the rationale why a method is preferred other, over other methods. But uh, um, I know t-test, uh, just a plain t-test uh, is not recommended, but a two-tailed toast is accepted for uh, comparability studies. Um, and there are other methods uh, that monoclonal field has used. Um, but again, um, uh, the method by itself is not gonna resolve some of the issues. Um, it has to be done in the context of historical data. It has to be done in the context of uh, ranges that um, are seen previously and and it's a, it's a complex um, undertaking to kind of show uh, a process doesn't impact product quality using 
limited number of samples, but uh, part of it is statistics and part of it is to have that historical justification for the method used uh, and looking at, um, at the ranges. Um, and um, th that would be an important consideration from my perspective, but there is no magic answers that I can give you here. So uh, maybe um, another sort of related question and uh, apologies to the audience. I'm gonna take a little moderator's license. So apologies if we don't get all, to all the questions, but I'm gonna pick and choose a little bit here. Can, can anyone uh, on the panel offer general advice on setting quantitative acceptance criteria, uh, comparability acceptance criteria, when you're in early phase clinical development where you, you don't, you just have a very small number of batches and you can't, you're not able to uh, apply statistical power. Yeah, maybe I'll just quickly, I, I would say um, it, it, it makes it difficult, right? If you don't have a big N, you, you're not gonna get uh, good power, right? That's just the, the nature of, uh, uh, of the science or, or the math in this case. Um, but uh, one thing you can do is look at um, the history of your, of your product, meaning you probably have smaller scale research, preclinical batches. Uh, so you have some history there. You probably have the actual tox batches, and then you have some GMP batches, hopefully. Um, now you may have introduced changes in there, so you have to be cautious of that, but that gives you a sense from you know, some of the basics of your analytics. Uh, the other thing is you'll, you'll certainly have specs. If you have a GMP process, you have to put some specs into your IND, right, to show your ranges. Um, other thing is assay variability. So if you have variability within your assay, uh, don't put your requirements for comparability within those, right, obviously, because you can't, you can't see differences. And then look at the breadth of your analytics. Uh, by now, you should have a pretty deep uh, analytical panel. Um, and often, you have things within that panel that will orthogonally confirm or um, you know, maybe challenge uh, one method versus the other. Thanks, Tim. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I would say that I, this is a very important question, the, the predetermined acceptance criteria. What's your justification for defining that in view of the statistics you use? And it has to be dri driven by your data uh, and the accumulating data and looking at the trend. And, um, uh, you know, it's given that the methodology changes during the process. Um, but as you accumulate more and more knowledge, this, uh, the range, the quality range for each attributes, I think is a key element of defining your predetermined acceptance criteria. Um, so minimum to, you know, upper range, are you seeing um, a huge variation? And again, I agree, uh, you have to also consider your assay variability. So you factor that in as well as your historical data and com combining the two in view of the methodology that you use, you can come up with some rationale for your predetermined acceptance criteria. Um, and I, I think uh, the more data you have, the more convincing you, you could be uh, when you propose uh, that predetermined acceptance criteria. So um, I, I definitely encourage uh, that type of approach based on historical data, even though uh, the data may have been obtained using different methodology. I, I think, you know, there's a couple of things that are in your advantage here. I mean, N is always a problem. But a lot of people are making products with the same cap set across multiple GOIs, right? So, um, and, you know, one of the strategies we used to use in oligonucleotides was qualifying the molecule in the process as opposed to, you know, you know so, so there's a lot of, you know, you know there's people use the term of platforming, but you can up your N, right, based on, you know, the portfolio of products you have, right? And standardizing your unit operations across each program, right? So, so you, can, you can start to see trends in your manufacturing process as it makes, so if you're all making the AV9 and you have three products in AV9, that's, you know, you, you get a lot more data on what your process does to make AV9. Now, obviously the GOI has some impact on, on some of this stuff, but you can 
you can probably work that out, right? So, so there is ways that you can power it up more efficiently. I, I, I think, you know, the other earlier question about spending the time on the scale down model, again, gives you an ability, you know, if you've got a really good science of scale approach done between the small scale and the large scale, you can then power your process variability by using small scales. And, it, and then it obviously, you need good analytical methods and you need orthogonality so you can measure you know the suite of quality attributes as they move as you make process changes so you know there's a sort of a all of above needs to be applied here but with that you can use i believe many of the statistical methods that people are using for recombinant proteins you know tolerance intervals and you know various other things across these methods these, these can be applicable here your biggest disadvantage is your n so having strategies to improve your N, um, I, I, I think, you know, become important. Thanks, Paul. I have a, a, a comment here in the Q&A from uh, an ex-FDA or with a lot of experience in, in, on the subject of ends and, and quantity material that's, that's needed. Uh, usually uh, in vitro potency assays need a lot of test sample volume. So take this into account when, uh, when assessing the volume of retained. So thank you for that. Thank you for that advice. Um, I think I'll, I'm just going to ask one more question. It's a little bit of a different question, but we'll take a we'll take a shot at it. So, uh, William, I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit. You're asking if the the end goal is to have a, a potency assay or matrix of assays in commercial lots. So we're in the we're, we're assuming we're at the commercial phase now. That prove the potency is within the acceptable range as the potency of the lots used in the pivotal study. I think the answer to that is yes. That's certainly the way I believe FDA views it. But uh, William asked an interesting follow-on question. If there's a product complaint, would potency assay data potentially help in the investigation or would it be used in the investigation along with identity and, and purity to determine whether or not the complaint was valid? Uh, any, any thoughts on that? Has anyone even encountered that, that situation? Well, I, I would say is that that's the purpose of actually the retained sample that you you have to buy regulation to have of any product that is manufactured commercially. You have to have retained in order to investigate, right? Um, but to to investigate whether the product is suboptimal, the potency is uh, is compromised or sterility is compromised, etc. There is there is a actual language uh, in regulation that you need to reserve certain amount two x for sterility and potency, and um, and that's a requirement. Um, uh, and it's it's done for purpose of investigation and root cause analysis. Got it. Thanks, Mel. So hope, hopefully that answered your your question, William. Great great answer, Mel. Um, so I think with that, uh, I'm, I'm gonna thank uh, all of the participants in the round table today. Uh, apologies for the questions that we didn't get to from the audience, but, um, but you know, I promise you we'll have a, an opportunity to do this again in, in the future. This is going to be an ongoing discussion. So uh, we're gonna take a little bit of a break uh, to allow everyone to stretch or depending on where you're at, possibly get a quick bite to eat. And we will be back uh, live at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time for a case study presentation on development of functional potency assays. Thanks, everyone. Okay, welcome back, everyone. I hope um, you were able to get a little bit of a break there. We're going to jump right back in to our programming for today. So first up uh, after the break, I would like to introduce Adam Davis, uh, Senior Director of Analytical Development at Forge Biologics, and also his colleague, Rebecca Raig, Scientist Level 1 in Product Development at Forge, who will be talking to you today or, or giving us an example of a development of functional potency assays. Adam, take it away. Thank you, Michael. And first, I'd like to, on behalf of Rebecca, myself, and Forge Biologics, thank the aging uh, committee for giving us the opportunity to present on development of functional potency assays. Uh, the agenda for our talk today will be a brief introduction to Forge Biologics, 
a potency assay design and implementation overview by myself, followed by a case study uh, from Rebecca on an early phase in vitro potency assay for FBX 101, uh, an AV gene replacement therapy for crab A disease. And we should have some time at the end for questions and answers. was founded on the belief that with the right people, you can push the limits of what can be accomplished in a gene therapy company. With the team we've assembled here at Forge, we're breaking down barriers in the gene therapy manufacturing space. Our mission is to enable access to life-changing gene therapies. And to do this, we've adopted a unique business model as a hybrid CDMO and therapeutics company. As a contract development manufacturing organization, we offer end-to-end -end AAV manufacturing from research grade through to CGMB production. As a therapeutics company, we have a pipeline of clinical stage AAV-based therapies. The synergies between our CDMO and therapeutic programs enable us to improve our platform process faster and gain insight as to how we can serve our external clients better. Building hope is not something that just happens. It's not passive. It requires intention, dedication, and commitment, and guides us to be better every day when we develop or manufacture therapies for rare genetic diseases, we're driven by a deep desire to build hope. Scientific curiosity, when paired with an exceptional team and diverse scientific experiences, is a recipe for innovation. This approach means we dedicate ourselves to solving complex technical problems, approaching obstacles with an open mind, which often leads to new and exciting scientific advancements. When we remove the bottleneck in gene therapy manufacturing, therapies will come to life at a rate the world has never seen before. We realized early on that when you solve the manufacturing problem, you literally save lives. Every element and detail within our build is intentional, and our facility was designed to uphold the highest levels of safety, quality, and precision. And the fact that it's a beautiful space, well, that's just a bonus. The team we have here at Forge is taking on the world of gene therapy to innovate, to inspire, and lead the way in accelerating a brighter future for patients and their families. So uh, thank you for indulging our, our video intro to Forge Biologics. Um, again, I'm Adam Davis, Senior Director of Analytical Development at Forge. I joined the team in October of 2020. Uh, and we have an analytical development team of over 25 scientists now that develops and has developed and operates over 20 in-house in assays uh, that support client development and pro some product specific qualification. Prior to Forge, I spent five years at Abiona Therapeutics as the director of manufacturing, where I manage outsourced clinical manufacturing and distribution, as well as product develop, process development and vector core production for early phase development. Before Abiona Therapeutics, I supported the development uh, for uh, process development for Valrox at Biomarin Pharmaceuticals. 
and completed my graduate school training at the Ohio State University and Center for Gene Therapy at the Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, before beginning my career. So Ford's Biologics is a hybrid model uh, that allows us to leverage the strengths of both the CDMO and therapeutics divisions to deliver on the mission of potential life-saving drugs to as many patients as possible. On the CDMO side, we offer both platform process as well as platform development, as well as platform analytical methods and analytical development specific to clients' products. These include, but are not limited to, plasma ratio DOE studies and cell to, uh, uh, excuse me, plasma to cell ratio DOE studies, as well as empty full separation development. Our facility located in Grove City, Ohio is over 200,000 square feet and uh, has 20, over 20 GMP suites, as well as proprietary technology, including our ignition cell line, a clonal cell line that's not only characterized for uh, cell growth kinetics, but also for yield. And additionally, a P ember ad helper plasmid that's minimized adenoviral components that could cause safety issues in, in product, potential product. Our, ma our manufacturing services include research scale blaze vector core production that scales from single liter shake flasks all the way to 50 liter single use bioreactors. We offer process development, again, as mentioned before, with uh, plasma ratio DOE, plasma to cell DOE, as well as downstream development for separation of empty and full particles all the way from one liter shake flasks and one liter single use bioreactors up to 500 liter bioreactors, and then toxicology lots from 50 to 500 liters and GMP lots from 50 to 5,000 liters. So while we're focusing on the development of potency assays today, I think it's important to note the rest of vector characterization that goes into getting a vector from the bench top to the bedside and ultimately from the bedside through commercialization. So our team here offers safety and quality characterization from bio burden, in vitro viral adventitious agents, sterility, sterility qualification, mycoplasma, mycoplasma qualification, endotoxin, replication competent AAV and appearance. While the sterility, sterility qualification, myco, myco qualification and in vitro adventitious agents are outsourced, the rest of these assays are completed at Forge Biologics under either validate, verification of compendial methods or qualification of the replication competent AAV. We also offer concentration and potency by digital, digital droplet PCR, where this method can be qualified on a per product basis for every client. Additionally, we offer capsulized infectious titer, again, a potency assay where we will qualify on a per product basis, uh, as well as total protein and product identity by next gen sequencing and mass spec for capsid identity. We also characterize integrity, identity, and composition where we look at genome integrity by viral vector purity, or excuse me, genome integrity by alkaline gel with cyber gold stain, next gen sequencing, capsid identity by mass spec, empty full ratio by AUC and the compendial methods of osmolality and pH. Finally, we can examine purity by particle aggregation by DLS, dynamic light scattering, subvisible particles, vector purity by capillary electrophoresis uh, polyacrylamide gel, residual DNA by qPCR, residual protein, by ELISA, residual E1A, and residual plasmid by DDPCR, residual affinity ligand by ELISA, residual benzenase by ELISA, and we outsource residual PEI and residual cesium chloride. From our therapeutic side, we're developing innovative gene therapies to help patients suffering from, life dev from devastating rare diseases. Our FBX 101 program for infantile crab A disease has gone through discovery proof of concept, IND enabling toxicology studies, and is actually in, enrolling the phase one, I, phase one, two IND study currently. While our program FBX 201 for an undisclosed rare pediatric disease has gone through discovery and proof of concept and is currently undergoing IND enabling toxicology studies, where both programs have orphan product and or rare disease pediatric designations. With that, we'll move into the introduction to potency assay design and implementation. According to the guidance from in, for industry from the Department of Health and Human Services and the FDA, potency is defined as the specific ability or capacity of the product, emphasis on specific ability or capacity of the product is indicated by appropriate laboratory tests or 
by adequately controlled clinical data. This is, it's important to note that these are obtained through the administration of the product in the manner intended and to give to affect a given result. So the, the results of these assays are this well-controlled clinical data. These potency assays are used in product release testing, comparability studies, and product stability studies. It's critical that companies plan appropriately for phase appropriate implementation of these potency assays where during the proof of concept and preclinical studies of your viral vector product, you need to demonstrate proof of concept, robustness testing and qualification before first in human trials. And that the assay and limits must be established for phase three lots and the assays must be validated and, re and ready for manufacture of commercial material. According to the ICH guidelines, potency is the quantitative measure of biological activity based on the attribute of the product, which is linked to the relevant biological properties. And thus, the advanced therapies med medicinal products potency is a reflection of the expected mechanism of action. It's important to note that the potency is the only critical quality attribute directly linked to potency. And, described in, and as described in a white paper from LabCorp, ideally potency assays for advanced therapies medicinal products should have the following key characteristics. They should reflect the mode of action of the advanced therapies medicinal product, predict product quality by unambiguously and reliably predicting clinical efficacy, be stability indicating, and able to differentiate between target and degraded products. They should be quantitative, although in practice, absolute quantification is often not achievable and a relative potency approach, comparing a test item to a reference standard is required. This is where you need to plan appropriately for phase, uh, for phase appropriate implementation uh, by having a reference standard available early in development to characterize and use for relative potency. Uh, and, the fi and finally, it should have a validated performance parameters and thus accuracy, sensitivity, reproducibility, and specificity. Uh, divine, defined performance limits are essential. So the first step in this characterization actually isn't a demonstration of potency, but we need to demonstrate, in order to demonstrate that potency, what we must show is that we have effective delivery of DNA from our recombinant adeno-associated viral vectors, uh, delivery of the gene of interest into the cells. And so in order to do that, we look, we look to the TCID50 assay with a linear dilution of vector with and without AD5 and HeLa RC32 cells, which constitutively express AAV, REP, and CAP. And additionally, we include AAV only controls as well as negative controls. We go through DNA extraction and quantification by qPCR and using the spearman carver method requiring one all positive row and one all negative row uh, to determine the TCID50 or infectious titer of our recombinant viral vectors. This infectious titer demonstrates that we're effectively delivering DNA above baseline in the cell from our recombinant associated viral vector. Recombinant AAV potency studies typically assess these product characteristics. We start with transcription. After we've, after we've successfully demonstrated that we've delivered DNA to the cells, what we can look at is the level of mRNA transcript relative to vector dose and above baseline for the cell type. Following demonstration of effective transcription based on the delivery of viral DNA, we can look at the level of protein expression, again, relative to vector dose and above baseline for the cell type. And finally, uh, if the desired product is an enzyme with functional activity and not just an expressed protein, uh, we, look at, we can look at relative activity of the enzyme, again, dependent on vector dose and above baseline for the cell type. The parameters that are critical to assess, uh, critical to assess as described earlier uh, for parameters of a, an effective potency assay start with linearity. And what this means is that we need to demonstrate that the method has the ability uh, to, to have linear results across dilutions, uh, typically with a five point dilution curve of the analyte in a given range. That range should also be established with an upper and lower limit of analyte detection uh, it, that is determined with suitable levels of precision, accuracy, and linearity. Then we look to specificity. It's the ability of, to directly assess the target analyte in the presence of components such as impurities, degradation products, or other matrix components. This needs to be demonstrated with a positive and negative control samples that do and do not contain the analyte. Again, specificity, the ability to, to discover the analyte and what's not analyte. 
Then we look to precision. This is going to be uh, a characterization of intra and intra-assay variability potentially across multiple operators or across multiple instruments or multiple days of performing the method. Uh, it's the degree of agreement amongst those individual test results across the aforementioned differences when the procedure is applied repeatedly to multiple samplings of a homogeneous sample. Uh, typically, this is assessed with standard deviation or coefficient of variation. Uh, an example of current guidelines is the percent CV for particle titer needs to be below 15%. Typically in, in assays like potency where we could have a higher degree of variability to dependent on the assay, um, it could be higher. Then finally, we look at accuracy. It's the closeness of the test result obtained by a procedure relative to the true or accepted reference value. This can be established in several ways. Um, it can be a reference standard um, recognized by the industry or it can be established over um, multiple testing of a single reference standard established early on in the process. Gene therapies present unique challenges for potency assay development. These start with complex or unclear mechanism, can start with complex or unclear mechanisms of action. With a complex or unclear mechanism of action, the appropriate method to characterize potency may also be unclear, necessitating a very broad approach. There can be complicated manufacturing processes. And with complicated manufacturing processes, it can increase the variability in potency. You may have limited preclinical data or clinical data to inform the activity. Where, pre, where limited preclinical data or clinical data to inform activity can require the assessment of multiple mechanisms of action. There could be limited number of products of product lots available to get an average of that potency. And with a limited number of lots, available can make it difficult to establish a range of potency associated with clinical efficacy. You can have very variable critical quality attributes. Again, delivery of DNA is a critical attribute and the infectious titer of lot to lot from, for recombinant AAV can vary greatly. And so these variable CQAs, which can be typical for advanced therapies and medicinal products, include infectious titer or empty to full ratio, and they can have a significant effect on potency. You can have multiple product attributes to evaluate, as we talked about, gene transfer, expression, and activity. And product stability may not be known. So with a high level of product stability variability, it can affect not only the assessment of a single lot's potency over time, but increase the variability across multiple lots. It's also important to allocate sufficient time because it's a complex biologic system, and it may require a potency assay matrix, again, looking at a variable degree of product characteristics uh, re related to potency um, that evolves as the product knowledge increases. And so you identify product attributes to assay, you establish a correlation between product attributes and potency assay matrix, assess the feasibility of the methodologies, both in terms of equipment and consumables, you test the relative potency, and you evaluate the methodologies to optimize, to optimize to reduce variability and improve signal to strength and refine the matrix, which you'll see in later in Becky's presentation. And then you assess method performance parameters and define acceptance criteria. So using an early broad matrix approach to multiple potential mechanisms of action helps to alleviate challenges associated with the complex nature of advanced therapies, medicinal products. Over time and multiple lots, the breadth of the matrix can be refined and revised. So in 1959, the principles of humane experimental technique published by Birch and Russell out of the Johns Hopkins School for Public Health presented the three R's alternative. It's the rationale for development of in vitro potency assays and shifting from in vivo potency or animal models to an in vitro cell, typically cell culture based method. Uh, so these three R's refer to the technologies or approaches associated that directly replace or avoid the use of animals in experiments by incorporating non-animal methods where they otherwise would have been used. Replacement can be broken down into two categories, full and absolute or partial and relative. This transition from animals to in vitro tissue culture enables a more diverse matrix driven, enables the more matrix driven approach, which with refinement can deliver a much more linear, accurate, precise and specific result. So we discussed uh, looking at transcript as one of the methods for determining in vitro potency. 
Uh, reverse transcriptase qPCR is a method to assess the relative or total amount of transcript over baseline, and it can be done in either a one or two step process. For the one step process, the advantages are less experimental variations since both reactions take place in the same tube. Fewer pipetting steps reduces the risk of contamination. It's suitable for high throughput amplification and screening, and it's fast and highly reproducible. The disadvantages associated with a one step system are that it's impossible to optimize the two reactions separately. Less sens it's less sensitive than the two step process because the reaction conditions are compromised between the two combined reactions and detection of fewer tar targets per sample. The advantages of the two-step system are that a stable cDNA pool is generated and that you can store for long periods of time and it can be used for multiple reactions. The target and reference genes can be amplified from the same cDNA pool without multiplexing. Optimization of reaction conditions and buffers can be used for each individual reaction and you have flexible priming options. The disadvantages associated with the two-step system are the use of several tubes and pipetting steps exposes the reaction to a greater risk of DNA contamination. It's time consuming and requires more optimization than one step. When we start to look at uh, the next step in potency characterization, what, we were, what we're going to look at is protein expression. And capillary electrophoresis Western blot is a method to quantify vector protein expression. At Forge Biologics, we use Replex with the JEST system from Protein Simple. And the capillary electrophoresis Western blot is a relatively rapid characterization of protein expression over baseline due to vector mechanism of action. The nice thing about this process is that it can be normalized to total protein expression in the same experiment, and that sensitivity is similar to immunoassay or an ELISA quantification. The drawback here is that in the case of an enzyme expression, it does not address the activity uh, of that specific enzyme. And so moving forward, Rebecca is going to present our case study, an early phase in vitro potency assay for FBX 101 AV gene replacement therapy for Crab A disease. Okay, thanks, Adam, for the great summary. Um, my name is Rebecca Ray. Um, I'll give a little background on myself before I begin. Um, so I joined Forage in 2020 um, on the product development team as a scientist a little over a year and a half ago. I've spent the majority of my time here focused on ground up development of our in vitro potency assay for our clinical stage program, FBX 101. Prior to joining at Forage, I spent a few years gathering molecular biology experience through my positions at UES out of Dayton, Ohio, as well as uh, during completion of my bachelor's degree uh, in microbiology at Miami University. So our FBX 101 program is centered around treating patients with Crab A disease. Um, Crab A disease is a rare neurogenerative disorder. It affects mostly the central and peripheral nervous systems. It's also a progressive leukodystrophy, which is caused by a mutation to the galactosyl ceramidase or uh, GAL-C enzyme. This causes sphingolipid buildup and eventual nerve death. And unfortunately, patients with Crab A disease typically will suffer from a very tragic premature death at age two. So our therapeutic approach to Crab A disease is FBX 101, which is a systemically delivered AAV gene replacement approach. Um, our AAV is packaged with the transgene for our protein of interest, GAL-C. So when we begin to consider design of potency assays, we want to holistically consider the biological properties and mechanism of action of our product, because our goal here is to design a test for key product attributes that will ultimately affect the product's function. So for our case, we are looking at an AAV delivery of DNA encoding our protein of interest. GAL-C, which is our protein of interest, is an enzyme with an already characterized known mechanism of action, which gave us a wide knowledge base to begin design from. This protein is also secreted. So it is produced in the ER and it is trafficked to the lysosome by the mannose-6-phosphate pathway, but it is also constitutively secreted to be taken up by neighboring cells. So this makes available to us two possible matrices to evaluate for activity of our enzyme. We can look at both the lysate, the inside of the cells, or the conditioned media that we grow them up in. So to test potency of our FBX 101 production lots, 
we have really taken to heart the three R's approach that Adam covered earlier, where we want to leverage a cell-based assay in favor of uh, avoiding our in vivo work. We also adopted an assay matrix approach so that we are looking at two complementary assays, which will total together to show us full um, potency of our product. And these are a relative assessment of enzyme activity, as well as a quantitative assessment of expression of our protein of interest. So this process begins with uh, delivery of our gene of interest by a transduction into adherent cells. So we will infect cells at two dosages with either a well-characterized reference lot of FBX101 or a test lot of FBX101. There are a couple untransduced um, negative control wells included here as well. 48 hours later, we'll harvest both conditioned media and cell lysate from these test samples. And each of those two sample matrices will be funneled into their own um, respective assays. So the conditioned media is used to assess that relative activity of our protein of interest. So we do this by exposing test samples to a fluorescent substrate called MuGal. Our GALC, as well as any uh, galactosidases present in the media are able to hydrolyze that substrate and release a 4MU fluorescent indicator that we can monitor at a specific wavelength. Additionally, on the cell lysate side, we're able to look at quantitative expression of our protein by capillary electrophoresis. This method allows us to ensure appropriate size of our protein, but also we can gather quantitative information relative to total protein present in the capillary. And of course, in a multi-day cell-based assay, there are plenty of opportunities for optimization and refinement. We come across our first set of those in the very first step of the process um, at the transduction stage. So when we began considering um, this first step of our process, we wanted to select the appropriate cell line for our purpose. And so we needed a permissive cell line with the appropriate glycan receptors for our AAV serotype. We also needed to consider whether or not we had any background expression of our protein of interest in this cell line. Would we be able to expect high background from that matrix? We also considered cell seeding density, plate coatings, and serum replenishment, all three of which are related to cell health and viability during the transduction step, which inherently introduces quite a lot of stress to the cells. So at those parameters, we were trying to optimize for cell adherence to the plate, as well as an optimal um, confluency so that we could optimize for transduction efficiency. Finally, we looked at viral dose. We wanted to not put so much AAV on the cells that we were causing cell death, but we did want to dose high enough that we could overcome any background signal present in the cell line. Next, looking at the sample harvest step, we evaluated our incubation time with AAV. I've seen anywhere between 24 to 72 hours for this step. Um, 48 hours seem to be our sweet spot, but this will need to be evaluated for your specific assay. Um, and additionally, we checked the cell lysis method. So we wanted a method that was harsh enough to give us sufficient yield of our protein, but not so harsh that we would be altering the conformation of the protein and losing activity. And then in the enzymatic activity portion of the assay, we checked on our incubation time with our fluorescent substrate, as well as substrate concentration. We wanted to ensure that we were providing excess of substrate to our samples so that we weren't seeing a plateau in the reaction as we were looking at activity. And finally, on the protein expression side, we screened a sufficient number of antibodies to ensure that we had the appropriate amount of affinity for our protein of interest. And we also looked at different antibody and sample concentrations so that we could optimize for signal to noise ratio within our capillary. And something else I want to note about this assay matrix design is that we, when, we spoke, when we speak about looking at um, activity and expression as endpoints, this is the mechanism of action of our product, but it does not include the transduction step naturally. So we want to look holistically at delivery of our gene all the way through to our relevant endpoints to consider holistic potency of the product. Great, so as we consider optimization and refinement, as Adam mentioned, it's also necessary to take a broad approach to your assay design. 
So we do this by performing exploratory studies that might lend process improvement or better characterization of product attributes that we're interested in. So for our case, we had two possible matrices to assess for enzyme activity. And so we infected, we infected cells across a wide dose range of FBX 101, and then we measured enzyme activity in each of those two matrices. So the graphs to the right represent fluorescent signal output produced by hydrolyzed substrate in our enzyme activity reactions, so that a higher fluorescent signal pictured there is indicative of more abundant uh, active GALC. What we found is that in cell lysate, we saw high background signal coming from endogenous GALC and that of other galactosidases present in the, in the matrix, um, making it necessary to dose at a high viral dose to achieve a minimal 2x signal increase above our background untransduced cells. Whereas in conditioned media, we saw that we were able to, at the same high viral dose, achieve greater than a 10x signal increase above our lowered background signal. So we were able to leverage the fact that GALC is a secreted protein to optimize for dynamic range in this assay. So in addition to those exploratory studies, you may also want to consider any available resources to you that you can leverage for the design of your assay. These resources could be any reference materials or controls that relate specifically to your product. So in our case, as Adam had mentioned, it's important to demonstrate linearity. Um, and for us, that was linearity of fluorescent signal in our enzyme activity assay. So to represent that, we generated a product specific enzyme activity standard by transfection with our transgene plasmid. So we introduced our gene of interest at large scale to cells, and then we harvested back a large bank of cell lysate that is concentrated with GALC. When serially diluted on the enzyme activity plate, we see linear and precise signal across multiple different runs and multiple different operators. So we were able to have confidence that performance of this standard is precise and we could use it to monitor integrity of any relevant reagents or our substrate, such that if the signal from these standards is showing up outside of expected limits, this would indicate a quality issue with one of our critical reagents. We also wanted to use this standard to demonstrate um, a relevant signal range to operate in for this assay. So we wanted to capture a dilution range of our substrate that would capture rel relevant signal we could expect from test samples. We also wanted to show that um, we could have a time point where we would optimize for signal separation and dynamic range while not running into the fluorometer saturation point on the equipment, which is represented by that red line. So five and a half hours seemed to be our most optimal incubation time for the reaction. And the dilution concentrations pictured there are representative of a dilution curve that would be used for routine analysis. So another key parameter of your potency assay is its specificity, which is its ability to detect only your target analyte in the relevant matrix that you're working in. So to represent specificity for this assay, we dosed cells at two dosages with a positive control FBX 101, as well as a nonspecific AAV that was packaged with the transgene for GFP. GFP expressed and present in our condition media matrix should not have any activity on our substrate, which is specific to galactosidases. And that's exactly what we see. So looking to the graph on the right, we saw a dose response when dosing cells with an increasing dose level of our positive control, FBX 101. While when we dosed with a nonspecific vector like an AEV GFP, we see signal either at or below our untransduced negative control. So we were able to demonstrate really robust specificity for this assay. Some other ways that you can consider demonstrating specificity could be a forced degradation experiment where you're exposing your product to a sufficient amount of heat and then you're measuring potency of that product relative to a positive control, or you can consider introducing a point mutation to your transgene so that the protein you're expressing is no longer active. So throughout all stages of development, qualification, and even validation, it's important to establish what your assay precision is. It's also important to look at the sources of variability that might be present in your assay. You can do this by performing robustness studies, which are small but deliberate changes to your method that 
will help you to understand their impact on the final result. So the sooner you characterize that variability, the better you can inform acceptance criteria that you'll set for qualification in early phase and then later on for validation in your late phase clinical investigations. So after performing robustness studies on this assay and qualification, we see that the assay yields precise measurements of enzyme activity on different days in the hands of three different operators. So at both low and high doses of reference vector or our test slot of FBX 101, we see biological replicates showing up with uh, demonstrated percent CV below 15%. Generally for a cell-based assay, you might see percent CVs around 30 to 50%. So we're really happy with the performance of this parameter. And early in development, as Adam had mentioned, you will want to try to set or establish a reference lot for your product. A reference lot should be product specific and it should be well characterized. It could be a clinical lot if that's available to you, but it should also be monitored on a stability plan. The reason we use a reference lot is to control for whole assay performance. Earlier, I mentioned that the activity standard we use is a control for our enzyme activity plates, but that is only the final step in the assay matrix. The reference vector demonstrates whole assay performance from the transduction step all the way through to the final endpoint. Measuring activity of our, ref of our test articles relative to our reference lot also will reduce inter-assay variability that's commonly associated with cell-based assays. As an example of that, say in an assay run where um, you have higher expressing cells and more activity across the board, your raw enzyme activity signal may increase from historical runs, but within that run, your relative score will remain constant. To showcase that phenomenon, we show that after assay qualification, we can demonstrate relative potency for a single lot within 6% at the 95% confidence level. I want to speak briefly about the other side of this assay matrix, which is the quantitative assessment of protein expression out of cell lysates. It's measured by capillary electrophoresis. So here I'm showcasing specificity of this test by transducing cells with two different lots of our FBX101 positive control and others with our nonspecific AAV as a negative control. And you can see that to the right, we do in fact have positive detection of GAL-C from only our positive control treated cells in capillaries one and two. Whereas when treated with a nonspecific AAV, we get a 10X lower signal of detection. What is being detected there is simply the endogenously expressed um, LC in those negative control treated cells. This assay is performed in supplement to the relative activity assessment to lend a quantitative component to our potency assay. Gene therapy development shouldn't be surprised that FDA recommendations are shifting towards um, verification of uh, expression or transcript level in addition to any relative activity assessment for your AAV gene therapy. And hopefully this case study has highlighted our answers to some of the unique challenges presented by potency assay development that were earlier laid out by Adam. So as he had mentioned, most gene and cell therapy products do have unclear mechanisms of action. Um, however, our protein of interest had a well-characterized mechanism of action at the start of development, which gave us a wide knowledge base to use when considering the design of our assay. And we also had reference, um, we're lucky enough to be a hybrid company, and so we're positioned really closely to our CDMO side which means that we were able to generate plenty of development lots as well as reference lots that we might need for this assay um, and test them robustly um, throughout development. So we were able to establish a reference lot early on to control for whole assay performance. And this is really just hammering in that point. That robust characterization is really important to understand performance of your assay. And so we were lucky enough to have those lots available to us. And finally, we touched a little bit on our assay matrix design, um, which couples together multiple key product attributes. So we demonstrated delivery of the transgene two cells while also quantitatively addressing expression of the protein of interest and its activity. And finally, we maintain a sufficient number of all of those development lots so that we can 
continue to test for their stability over time. And this will help us to inform expiry dating and acceptance criteria to set for future assay implementation. And with that, we are open for questions. Thank you, Adam and Rebecca. Really, really, really nice work. Um, I'll start out with maybe a, a question of my own. So you have uh, a, a matrix approach, two assays, uh, expression and activity. You mentioned with the expression assay that there may be, you hinted at some additional agency requirements um, around that and that, you know, relative expression might not be sufficient. Are, are you going, do you know yet, are you going to have to switch to a different assay? And I guess, do you see yourselves carrying that assay forward as, for, uh, as a release assay, or is it really just uh, informational in your mind? Yeah, do you want me to? Oh yeah, go, go ahead, ahead Adam. Uh, so, no, I think it's, it's I think the relative potency assay is what we plan on moving forward with for qualification and eventually validation. We're just simply supplementing that data, you know, connecting the dots really. So we've, we're going to qualify the TCID 50 to demonstrate infectious titer and variability for the vector. And it's really connecting the dots between that assay and the qualification of the potency assay showing that infection leads to transcript, transcript leads to protein, protein leads to activity. Great. Uh, another question from the audience uh, for Rebecca. Uh, for lot release assays, uh, such as the ones you showed, uh, six well two day, what is your approach for commercial methods that may need higher throughput due to product demand? And uh, when are you thinking about addressing this? So we are fairly early on in development of this assay. Um, right now we're using it for just our early phase clinical investigations. And so we will continue to optimize for throughput as we approach validation um, later on. Um, and then we'll probably start to consider our, our commercial application. I'd like to, I'd like to tag on to that answer as well, that um, another solution to throughput for release or stability assay is increased lot size. And if you're able to pr produce sufficient lots that have sufficient stability, um, that can reduce your number of samples for release or stability testing. Another question that I had about the um, the activity assay and the condition media. So really uh, outstanding coefficient of variation results. Um, and do do you worry at all that they're a little too good, or that maybe that it, and it, if you're not able to hold that going forward, do you do you feel like you'll be able to justify you know what is normally accepted as a as a coefficient of variation in these types of assays, or are you pretty confident that's uh, you're going to maintain those kind of numbers going forward. You know, we hope to see that they do remain at that level. Um, we are trying at every step to characterize the robustness of this assay and to tighten up parameters that might be showing us more variability. Um, but so far, we're three operators in, and it remains to be seen that that CV does go up. Um, so we'll just continue to test lots and, and see where it ends up. All right, but again, great, really great work uh, to, to this point. Um, I'm going to pause for a second. Other questions from the audience? Don't be don't be shy. This is your opportunity to to ask the presenters anything. So I'll 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 ask another one. Um, so you know you really emphasize the importance of the three R's, and I appreciate that. There, there's some circumstances, though, in, in which in vivo assays are still being used for release, actually, is, is my understanding. And uh, at, at times, I've heard that um, it can be challenging, you know, once you sort of get far enough down the development pathway with those assays to sort of switch over to, to an in vitro assay. Um, I'm wondering if this came up at all in your conversations with the agency, or did you just start early enough uh, with, with a you know a non-animal based model that uh, it's just not not a factor or a concern in your development. No, that's a great question, Michael. And and while I, I don't necessarily want to speak directly to our interactions with the agency on this program, I certainly think um, an aspect of willingness to accept this is the early implementation of it. 
Uh, that being said, I, in previous experience, I have had interactions with the agency where um, they prefer uh, in certain circumstances uh, an in vivo assay. But I think the importance is the ability to um, have sufficient reference material that you could, uh, upon development of a successful in vitro assay, uh, bridge the data using multiple reference lots or multiple lots from your in vivo data to the in vitro data. And again, like everything else with the agency, everything is data driven. And so if you're able to demonstrate that the ability to bridge that from the in vivo to the in vitro um, successfully, I think it still makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great point about everything being data driven. And I, I would just you know offer the observation about uh, in vivo assays and you know, in addition to being expensive, time consuming, uh, potentially really hard to validate, they, they I mean, one of the potential upsides of them is they, they sometimes can be easier to interpret, but sometimes they offer the illusion of being <laughs> easier to interpret. And I think that's why sometimes uh, people kind of tend to fall in love with them. But and so it's, it's a good uh, cautionary tale, I think. And, and again, really appreciate your emphasis on, on the three R's in, in the context of your, your assay development. Uh, we've got a few questions from the audience coming in now. Uh, how do you address similarity parallelism between test and standard? Um, abstractly or in the context of the assay we've developed here? Sorry. Um, lacking further clarification, I'll let you answer it the way you choose. <laughs> the way you choose. Okay, so can you repeat the question? I apologize. Um, how do you address similarity parallelism between test and standard, the test sample, and I, I guess your reference standard is the way I'm interpreting this. Oh, I understood. Um, and, and Becky, you can jump in if I get out of my lane here. Um, but, but the reference standard in this case is a direct expression of the enzyme from transfection of plasmid, the same plasmid that's used to generate the recombinant vector. And so we're quite confident in the parallel of that enzyme from both from transient transfection and expression from the recombinant vector derived from transient transfection of that plasmid along with RepCap and Ad Helper. So another question, uh, have you observed correlation between protein expression and activity um, between the two assays, I guess? Is, is all protein expressed fully active lot to lot um, or, or is it just too early to know that at this point in your in your experience? I think it's a little bit early. We're still kind of fleshing out the experiments to determine those connecting the dots. Uh, it's the data that we've presented is relatively early uh, for the protein expression. And we continue to develop the reverse transcriptase method uh, to demonstrate level of transcript on a multi-lot uh, multi basis. But I think we'll be able to tie those together as we generate more data from multiple lots for protein expression uh, as well as transcript. Um, question about uh, stability indicating properties of the potency assay. Um, so I guess the, the question is, have, have you been able to demonstrate yet that your, your potency assays are stability indicating that uh, they can detect virus with uh, less activity? It's a little early to say. Um, I haven't personally reviewed the data from, I believe, our first time point for our toxicology lot. Um, so we'll have to we'll have to get back to you on that one. Okay. There's a question about CV, which I think um, you addressed. There's a um, question about those. This is interesting. Uh, how do the doses that you use in your in vitro assay compare to the expected estimated level of product against the targeted cells in patients? So I guess uh, I'll just reword that a little bit. Is there a correlation between uh, the dose or amount you're using in your in vitro assay and, and what you expect to be or anticipate the dose to be in a, in a patient? Are those correlatable? That's a great question. Um, and I think that's something that we'll have to collate the data as we proceed with our early phase clinical trials. As we generate the data for release and stability using the in vitro potency assay, being able, we'll be able to, to, to collate that data and look at 
the relative relative potency in the in vitro assay to biomarkers um, and clinical assessments associated in the clinical trials. So I think over the course of, of the execution of the clinical trials, having this data in hand for each lot uh, will enable us to make that correlation. Okay. Sounds like we're gonna to have to have you both back and uh, to, to do this again in a year or so. Um, it's gonna look over in the chat window where we have some other comments. Um, can you comment on the, the statistical method or, or even the software that you're using to assess relative potency um, or using an F-test? So this is a two-dose scheme as it stands right now. So we are um, assessing um, sort of as an accuracy component um, between two lots manufactured in the same way. Um, we can look at the relative activity of one to the other, um, but this is a raw value. Okay. Um, I think you touched on this in an earlier question, but I, I don't want to overinterpret it. So I'm going to uh, ask another question from the audience regarding uh, GALC activity. Um, it was mentioned that the standard you're using was generated with cell lysates transduced with your AAV. Is it clear that the GALC activity of the intracellular stores is identical to secreted GALC? So the purpose of that lysate standard that we're using in the enzymatic activity assay is more so to establish signal linearity of our fluorescent substrate um, and to monitor um, quality of our critical reagents. So we're less so equating um, this to a specific activity of GALC present in the lysate versus that in our test samples that are conditioned media, um, and more so using this to monitor assay performance and reproducibility of our results. And it's important to note, I, I caught, I think they, the interpretation that it, those uh, cell lysates were the product of transduction, those are direct transfection with the gene of interest plasmid alone not transduction with viral vector. Okay, good, yeah, it's a good clarification, thank you. Um, so we still have a, a few more minutes and at least one more question here. So um, back, back to the CV, so three operators, great numbers, uh, and apologies if, uh, if you did show this and, and I missed it, but um, have you looked at lot-to-lot -lot variation or, or what effect uh, different lots from your cell line will have uh, on the CV? Yeah, so it's early to know. Um, we've completed assay qualification fairly recently. And so those um, CVs shown for um, that 6% certainty um, are performed on a single lot that we've been able to get our hands on after assay qualification. So we'll continue to test more lots going forward to fully characterize that lot to lot performance in the assay. Okay, great. So I think I'll just pause for another moment in case anyone wants to come in with a late breaking question, but I think you, uh, I think you got to all the questions. Congratulations. Thank you, Michael. Again, we appreciate the opportunity. Good. I think, yeah, I, I, absolutely. Uh, anytime. And uh, thanks for uh, being so open with, uh, with the data and great job with the presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much. So we're a few minutes early. I believe we have all the panelists for the, uh, or sorry, the presenters for the next presentation. Um, does everyone from, uh, from Andalyn want to come on? Come on camera and I will introduce you. Absolutely. Welcome. All right, so our next presentation uh, will be about facility design, which is I think a very interesting topic that we actually didn't cover in aging. It was out of scope, but obviously very important. Uh, so happy to have uh, Adeline Biosciences here today. We'll have three presenters. Uh, talking about this topic. I want to introduce first uh, Dr. Shamir Acharya, 
He is the Associate Director of Process Development at Andalin. He joined Andalin Biosciences in 2019. He's responsible for process and platform development, optimization, characterization, and technology transfer. Uh, Dr. Achara has over 25 years of research experience in mechanisms of genomic instability and pathways of cell survival and proliferation. His expertise is in the fields of biochemistry, molecular and cell biology, and cancer. He has extensive, extensive experience in assay and method development, utilizing tools involving molecular and cell biology. Molecular genetics, microbiology, microscopy, protein purification, biochemical, biophysical analysis, and enzyme kinetics. Uh, he has his bachelor's degree or received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from St. Stephen's College, University of Delhi, a master's degree in biotechnology from Jawaharlal Nehru University, and a doctorate degree in biochemistry from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, uh, India. Uh, also presenting today will be Cyril Kellerhalls, the head of manufacturing. Cyril joined Andalin in 2021. He oversees viral vector and plasma GMP manufacturing. He has over 20 years of quality and manufacturing leadership experience uh, across Asia, Europe, and North America in the biopharmaceutical, pharmaceutical, and medical devices industry. He received his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and an MBA with specialization in business analytics from the Whitman School of Management at Syracuse University. Uh, and last but not least, Kenneth LaRiviera is the head of engineering at Andalin. He's worked in the pharmaceutical industry for 35 years, including 27 years at Merck. At that time, his focus was predominantly on vaccines and biologics engineering and facilities. He joined Andalin in June 2021 to lead the design, construction, and startup of their flagship manufacturing facility in OSU's innovation district and to build the organization to support their growth. Prior to joining Andalin, Ken was a consultant supporting numerous biotech companies with a focus on compliance and engineering and facility space. He has a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Villanova and an MBA with a finance focus from Rutgers University. Uh, welcome, and I'll turn it over to you yeah. for what I'm sure will be a great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, all right, uh, let me move that over. I hope everybody can see my screen. Good afternoon, good morning. Uh, welcome to this presentation. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction of, of, of our panel. Uh, I'm really happy to present today something about quality by design and how we at Andal and Biosense are managing quality by design throughout the different stages and throughout the different departments on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think Michael did a really great job. And um, again, it's for me, it's a really great opportunity to be part of that of this team here together with Samir and, and Ken. And I think one of the key items why we are so excited to be part of Andalin is really what Andalin stands for. It's really a, a clear vision and mission statement. And, and if you don't know, but Andalin is a combination of, of two of our first patients, Andrew and Evelyn. And, we had a, just last week a big uh, celebration of our new um, development center here in Dublin, outside of Columbus. And we had the honor to have Andrew, which was part of our name or is part of our name to be have him on site. Um, as I think many of you also know, Andalin is a relative new company. And what I mean with new, Andalin is a spin-off of the Nationwide Children's Hospital. And we were formerly uh, announced or created a little bit more than two years ago. But nevertheless, uh, we have a quite strong legacy with more than 15 years of experience around viral vector manufacturing. We produce more than 400 plus CMG clinical lots. And we have a really strong network uh, with strategic partners, Paul and Saitiva. We are located here in Columbus, Ohio. And you see that on this little map here, we, we have several facilities which we are consolidating as we speak. So we have several office manufacturing space here on the NCH campus, so Nationwide Children's Hospital. We have our new plasma facility here uh, in the building which I'm sitting. And then we have the two um, 
facilities, uh, one in Dublin, the development center, and and really the corporate manufacturing center or the ACC, how we call it. What is really here and goes a little bit in the topic here, why it's so important to have close proximity between the different locations. It really helps to transfer technology, knowledge, the ideas between the sites on a, in a really simple pass forward. And I'll be from, from my office to Dublin to, to, the, to the manufacturing sites is 15, 20 minutes. So it's, it's a really close relationship between non-GMP, GMP, drug substance, drug product, and it's really nicely tied together. And this is all about what quality by design is, is really to start early with this whole understanding what around quality by design you need to really actively force it and with this closeness we we definitely do that on a day-to-day -day basis so how do we besides the location how do we really drive that forward first of all of course quality by design it starts with the process it's then going into the design of of the process itself and then the operation and i will give a, a little bit of an understanding what we do from a process standpoint then some year we'll go into the details how we control the process how we how we uh, really understand the process with our throughout our PD, so process development activities, can go then in the, in the really into the design of the new facility on how, what kind of principles we used um, during that design phase. And I will close out the presentation with really focusing on the operational part. So from a manufacturing process control and life cycle management, again, we have quality type by design is part of our day-to-day -day interaction it's part of our dna and it's 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 not just you know starting quality by design when you have your process when you do your aev production it's really to understand which materials and especially plasmids has a big component which materials are impacting your final product what what is important how can i really tweak it and the way how we do it we have we have extensive experience with with multifactorial DOEs and process characterization, where we really, you know, starting to compare different factors with each other. For example, incubator, where we grow our cells, you know, what is what is the critical factor? Is it the CO2 concentrations? Is it the temperature? Is it the time? And with multifactorial DOEs, you start to play around and find the optimal, you know, situation where you get the the, the best growth. Of, of your cells uh, throughout the, the, the manufacturing process. Going back to our legacy history, you know, and goes back a little bit why I picked uh, an MBA with focus on, on business analytics. Data, I think, is, is absolutely crucial. And we are harvesting this data on a regular basis with data mining and data analytics, where we really go into the details, uh, where we start comparing, comparing batch uh, out outcomes with with each other you know according to zero type for the different clients and see hey yes this this combination work better so this will help us to provide them the right input to the next client or circle back to the to the current clients say hey i think this is way how we will want to do it what the, the overall goal is around you know all the data mining, all the understanding, all the DOE's process characterization is really to create a process which is reproducible and robust. And, and we have with that, again, you will see that on a later stage, we have multiple uh, systems and tools and process which are supported by a comprehensive in-process sampling throughout that all the manufacturing stages is start with uh, when we start growing cells, till we have the product in our final primary packaging container. Last but not least, what is important, and going back to the location between where we have GMP manufacturing, where we have the process development, analytical development, we, we really transfer the knowledge from one side of our organization to the other side, which helps them to allow us a really robust uh, manufacturing uh, for for the clients, uh, you know, and then at the end supporting that the vision and mission statement of Andalin. So uh, I'll take over, Cyril. Uh, thank you for um, giving a nice introduction to what we do at PD. And as Cyril said, uh, uh, our process really starts at a small scale level where 
as many of you know uh, and also do, it starts with analysis of various factors which would be uh, responsible for whatever attribute we are looking for. In our case, we started with looking at titers and what affects titers uh, at small scale, and then we scaled it up uh, to have a list of scalable and uh, scale dependent and scale independent factors. Uh, our goal was always to see uh, how scalable our platform is, not just in terms of titles, but how we also decided to develop analytics to monitor the quality of the virus as we progress. And, and granted, uh, like everyone knows, uh, there are uh, that requires a whole lot of effort, and we work closely with the analytical development team to uh, have as many assets as possible. So, in the end, uh, as proof of how stable our platform is and how scalable it is, we have looked for consistency at each of these stages consistency in titles as we grow from small scale to large scale, and that's shown in this slide. Uh, just two stereotypes are given, for example, uh, as and you can see that uh, regardless of the scale, uh, it's pretty much consistent. Uh, stereotype B, we're getting titles around 1.3 to 1.8 uh, E11 uh, vector genomes per mil, and stereotype E, you're getting around between four and five uh, E11 vector genomes per mil. So uh, this shows that whatever parameters we uh, shows uh, are working so far. And I, I think as someone mentioned earlier on that one of the most important things that we look for is uh, transfection. So we do have a set of analytical techniques we develop to monitor the transfection size. And one of those things I think are responsible for in addition to other factors for such scalability. So the next slide shows how we, uh, with, is there consistency in downstream? So as we progress, we have used the same set of uh, DOE uh, principles to see how tarification works or TFF works and the final recoveries uh, as we choose chromatography columns or ultra simplification column. Importantly, uh, the last panel shows what kind of purity that we're getting in this. We are consistently getting between 99 to 100% purity. Uh, and uh, as anyone uh, knows, uh, how do we say 99 to 100% really depends on your analytical techniques. So we have used a bunch of techniques. Uh, obvious one is shown in the next slide. And here we also are comparing uh, two different methods for purifying our, uh, and enriching our viruses. One is the classical ultra centrifugation based purification, where you see consistently similar purities across scales. And we've also developed an all column purification scale, which becomes more and more important as we scale up. We, we, I think uh, uh, we save a lot of time um, and effort uh, if we do an all column purification. So uh, SCSGL is not the only criterion we use for monitoring our purity. Uh, we use a bunch of analytical techniques. The next slide shows uh, uh, just a few of them which we are considering for purity and quality. Of course, capillary electrophoresis is becoming a gold standard for everywhere. Uh, we have seen consistently a 99 to 100% purity. And we also get an idea of more accurate idea of uh, the, uh, the viral protein ratios as we go further and they are consistent with what the standards are in the, in the industry. Uh, one of the most important uh, uh, methods for, uh, or for indicators of quality are uh, MT to full ratios. And we have, while we use AUC uh, as a final measure of full to empty ratio, we've also developed HPLC method, which is far faster uh, given the supply chain issues and um, uh, the time it takes to get the empty full uh, range. So this is, We've done a 20 minute procedure. We track the purity as we purify, track the quality as we purify it, and decide on which chromatographic columns we use. So we have got, we're consistently getting between uh, 88 to 98% percent of full to empty ratios. And that's where we are. So once we have all this, uh, this stability of the platform, then that then process becomes ready for tech transfer. And while we do the tech transfer, that then leads to a process flow diagram. So that's where we transfer it and then, then the, comes the design of the uh, facility. So I, at this stage, I will transition to uh, Ken. Thank you very much, Samir. Uh, you know, when folks think about uh, QBD, it's usually, you know, you think about process or product development, you know, applying QBD principles to, to those tasks, but, but you can really apply those same principles to design, facility design. 
So the best best case scenario with the facility design is you have a very well defined process with the CPPs are known, and and that's where the the design begins. But that rarely happens. So um, uh, especially in the space where we work in in the CDMO space, you have to be flexible enough to meet the customer's needs. Any customer that that uh, you're able to support. So how do you do that? You you uh, if you really design a facility that meets the latest uh, ISPE guidelines, other industry guidance, and you know what what I think is really most important is having cust uh, company SMEs involved in the process. These SMEs with practical experience that have lived through design startup of facilities that have those uh, you know that that tribal knowledge that uh, is not always written down, but uh, you know, hugely beneficial to facilities, building new facilities. So, you know, if you're a, a small company like Andalin, um, you know, being able to uh, hire these type of folks early in the process is, is uh, critically important. If you don't, if you can't, you know, you can rely on consultants that are, again, uh, you know, industry leaders uh, with, with practical experience. So, do not rely on engineering firms, uh, you know, the guidance for that you get from engineering firms. Uh, they can certainly, you know, give you guidance on, you know, what, what they've designed previously. But at the end of the day, uh, it's your facility and you need to make it not only start up, but, uh, you know, work uh, and, and meet the needs of the, the uh, you know, the researchers or the manufacturing folks for many, many years to come. So early engagement, uh, critically important from, you know, early engagement from operations folks, from quality folks, and what I like to think the most important folks, the engineering folks. Uh, so, um, you know, engineering, uh, you know, has to have input from the very beginning. You know, critical components like HVAC design. How do you want to set it up? There are many, many ways to do that with, dedicated air handlers versus shared air handlers. And do you want to have once through air versus recirculated air? Uh, you know, the, these are, you know, I guess process uh, driven decisions. You know, what's the process look like? Where do you need, you know, uh, that, that critical once through air versus an area that you might not need it. Uh, once through air uh, is very expensive. Uh, you know, you take a day like today here in central Ohio, it, it's not too hot out. It's probably in the mid 80s, but you're going to cool that air down from 85 degrees to 50 degrees uh, discharge air temperature of 55 degrees. It takes a lot of energy to do that. So um, you have to be wise about when you need it and when you might not need it. So, you know, in our facility at Andalin, we have eight clean rooms. Uh, and we have an individual air handler with single pass air for our manufacturing rooms, uh, you know, set up from the beginning. So could we have done it differently? You know, there are different schools of thought. There's benefits to one way versus another. You know, if we paired two air handlers together, you know, single pass air, so there's no issue of cross-contamination. But, uh, you know, I can save some money on an air handler but it doesn't give me the flexibility that I need uh, when, when maintenance activities, you know, come up. So these are things again, that a seasoned SME can share some light and help, uh, you know, help the engineering firm come to a, uh, you know, a final design. The next thing I thought about was emergency power. So that's another thing for central Ohio. Uh, um, uh, we had rolling, uh, you know, brownouts uh, last week. I, I spent one night on my front lawn because my air, air was out, and my power was out at my home. So uh, that's not going to happen. So we have, um, you know, emergency power set up. Uh, we actually have four megawatts of, of emergency power uh, in our design. But there's some really cool features of uh, electronic gear now where you can shed loads and add loads if you configure the equipment appropriately. So uh, you know, that that's another engineering consideration. What's going to run utility wise, you know, through a power outage, you know, you can run an air handler, but if you don't have a chiller on, on backup power, you, you can't operate for very long in the middle of the summer. 
So these considerations have to be uh, thought through uh, and decided upon early. Then, you know, gets to redundancy of utilities. Uh, where does it make sense to spend the money? Uh, you know, nobody has unlimited resources. It'd be awesome if we could have a double of everything. We, nobody has the money to do that. It's not wise. So you got to think about where you get the biggest bang for the buck, where, you know, the, the robustness of the systems, you know, may be, you know, not as robust and you really want to have a backup where other systems may be, you know, it's very unlikely you'll have a failure. So that the, all these items need to be considered. Um, and flexibility of operations, you know, as, as a CDMO, we have to be able to adjust uh, to our customers' needs. So we set up our facilities to be flexible uh, and we can move equipment in and out. Um, you know, utilities are available. Everything that we can think about is available in the suite. So, you know, we can, we, we can, we can uh, support our customers, you know, with an, just about any equipment that they, uh, they need. Certainly height is a, a limitation. You know, you, you'd like uh, some areas, maybe some operating areas that with high base suites, uh, but um, you know, that, that's really our only limitation is height. You know, that's not something you can change. Uh, then, you know, you think about expandability. So, you know, first off, do you have the footprint to expand the facility? You know, uh, you know do, you, do you have the footprint? If you do have the footprint, Something to think about, you know, maybe you don't, you, you're, you don't want to invest in, you know, the, the utility infrastructure, but you can do some simple things like maybe upsize the piping. So that, that's what we did. We put in larger pipe size for our chilled water uh, in our other utilities. So, uh, you know, we do have a planned expansion. If we want to go ahead and move forward with that, we don't have to interrupt anything else. Our chillers are set up where we can connect another bank of chillers. Our piping is sized to uh, accommodate the additional flow. So these, again, all these engineering concepts really need to be ferreted out, uh, you know, early in the process in the design phase. So I spoke about engineering, but then, you know, there's operational needs. Certainly uh, understanding the operational needs is critically important. You know, layout of the room. Um, you know, most equipment is portable, but there are some fixed equipment, you know, uh, so that needs to be decided early on. You know, we, we, uh, we have exhausting biosafety cabinets in our operating suites. Well, you know, one, two, you know, what, what do you need? Because with an exhausting hood, it's not easy to add. Uh, so that really needs to be nailed down early. Changes late in the game cost money, uh, time and in, in, uh, in money. So important to just, um, you know, make sure you, you ferreted that out and make sure you have a good design that meets the needs of, of the, uh, you know, the operating folks. And then power, you know, wh what do you need on UPS power versus emergency power versus regular power? Obviously from, from left to right, they, there's, there's a greater cost. So you don't need to have, say, a refrigerator on UPS. It can afford to stop for 10 seconds as the e-gen spools up. So you need to think about that and maybe make some uh, decisions on what is on UPS power versus emergency power right from the beginning. Uh, the next is, you know, redundancy and process equipment. You know, do you want backup incubators available? Can we, you know, is it important? Is it critically important to the process? Those, those things need to be decided because you need to have the utilities for that. Um, pressurization scheme, what, what's important in the operation of the rooms? Is cleanliness the most important or is cross-contamination and cleanliness important? Or maybe you're running a, a potent compound and containment is important. So those decisions uh, need to be made. That will dictate how you design the airlocks and air flows and pressurization. So, uh, you know, it needs to be, uh, it needs to be decided early, you know, uh, in the design. Uh, and that's, that comes from the involvement from the operational folks. And then uh, unidirectional flow of people, materials uh, and waste, you know, that, that's obviously industry standard. Uh, you know, you have to, you, you can't uh, mix, you know, people, materials and opposite flows. It has to be unidirectional. So the next 
So here's a picture of, of one of our operating suites. Um, we have it, uh, again, Andalyn's a, a CDMO. We ha will have multiple customers. So we, you know, so um, cross-contamination is critically important. So we've set up our air handlers uh, as sinks. So we can, you know, to minimize the potential for cross-contamination while maintaining the highest pressure in the operating area. Our air, you know, our, our clean rooms are modular, modular clean rooms uh, supplied by AES. As I mentioned, we have exhausting biosafety cabinets. Um, our manufacturing suites are 100% outside air uh, and one air handler for each suite that allows us to do like rolling shutdowns. I, I can, you know, I don't have to take the entire facility down, you know, in the middle of the summer or whenever for a shutdown. I, I can shut one suite down at a time or two suites down at a time, do the maintenance on the air handlers, bring it back up and, and still keep the building running. Um, uh, dedicated material and personnel airlocks, as I mentioned, unidirectional flow. Uh, what, what's pretty slick uh, with the AES design is that we have a walkable ceiling. Uh, so, you know, it is uh, walkable, uh, but obviously there's a lot of utilities up above the ceiling. You know, HEPA filtration is everywhere. So we have ductwork and piping and so forth, but it does provide uh, a little easier access if we want to do some modifications later. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's a nice design. Uh, one of the other things we talked talked about or thought about was, you know, redundancy in some of our technical components. You know, uh, N plus one. So our air handlers, uh, fans. You know, there's an extra fan in the, uh, you know, in, in the air handler. So if one motor went down, the other uh, operating motors can pick up the slack. And so we won't have, you know, won't, won't bring that, uh, that room down. And I mentioned about the pressure cascade with the uh, sink airlocks is designed really to isolate each suite. Next. So um, we, uh, we, we have some drone footage uh, of the facility. So this is our, uh, our new ACC, which is Andalyn uh, Corporate Center. Uh, this is on uh, the OSU's Innovation District, uh, where the anchor uh, facility and uh, you know, the first flagship facility in, in the Innovation District. Gilbane is our uh, construction management company uh, and they, they provide us it's pretty slick. They provide the drone footage about once a month so we can kind of chronicle the progress we've made. The west side, the east side of the building, we have our, our chiller chiller facility on the roof, uh, uh, cooling towers and process chillers. And, um, and you can see just beyond there is where our footprint for expansion, just after that sort of dark, dark bump out, that's where we have planned for uh, uh, our expansion. So that's already designed into the footprint uh, and, and some of the utility systems um, for our uh, future expansion. Oh, and then I'll hand it back to Cyril. Thank you so much, Ken. So to close out our presentation and to go to the operational part, what is really important and it's really how we approach it, the whole quality by design is really to have a seamless transfer from, from some years team to, to my organization. This means we, we have the same equipment uh, in the GMP and in the non-GMP facility. So, for example, Samir has a 200-liter bioreactor from Paul. We have the same equipment, the same version of software in my facility at in the facility. So, from some from Ken, we will have we have the same uh, platforms. So, suspension, a Terran platform, we have the same same. So, this allows us really to have a seamless transfer from from one side of the organization to the other side. We also use the same material. So 
if we have an inherent production in the PD lab that uses a Corning hyperstack, we have the same hyperstacks uh, in the GMP uh, facility. So there's never a question, oh, is this information really transferable? Is this data which we generated in the PD lab, is this really transferable to, to then uh, the large scale manufacturing? It's absolutely this. We use the same validated and qualified equipment on the analytical side. So we have strong collaboration between AD analytical development and then the QC folks. And we have for overall, we have the same quality management system. So there's no distinction between non-GMP and GMP. We all follow the same rules. Of course, it's phase appropriate. There's a little bit more freedom in the, P, in the PD and AD side. As soon as it gets in the GMP space, it's a little bit more tight and with more quality oversight. But fundamentally, we have, we have the same quality management system across all Andalin's uh, operations. So as you saw, brand new facility, and it's really exciting to, to get in this new facility, and we are really on the home stretch. And what is an absolutely master now, so here comes in the quality by design thinking, is how do we qualify? How do we commission? How do we um, calibrate? How, how we get everything ready? And it's, it starts with a really with a cross-functional approach. We get into... Uh, to designing of a validation master plan, which is really helping us to set the, the cornerstone, how we get approach that. And then it has to be really systematically through, get the right requirements defined. It goes back to what uh, what Samir does in the labs to understand what do we have to, what do we have to measure, what do we have to define. It's the same here. So we have a URS, which helps us to, to identify what is the rules of requirements. Then with the system, uh, classification it helps us to understand okay this is this system is a computer system validation requirement what kind of requirement have to follow there and then really go through the process and then at the end of the day it's it goes back to this life cycle approach so when you have the qualification the iqo qpq etc done and it's operational you go in then in the periodic review with annual maintenance calibration with the change control to have really this continuous improvement loop, which goes back to this to this process, um, thinking process approach of continuous process improvement. Of course, the validation uh, approach is clear. We wanna have a qualified validated facility, which allows us to produce our products in a consistent manner, in a, in a robust way and it's really, again, it's the start and the end, what we do every day here. It's really to have the, the proper, in this case for the facility, do we have the proper material? So the bill of material, did we construct it? Did it install it? So it's this continuous um, this feedback loop, this continuous in the cross-functional um, alignment across the organization. So in spirit of time, let me jump to the, to the key takeaways. Quality by design, it, it has to be a way of thinking. It has to be in the DNA of, of, of an organization. And with this way of thinking, it really, there are four big advantages. It, it helps to prevent failures if it's a deviation or to a rejection of batch because with understanding how the process works and with the under, understanding how the different parameters interact, you, you can make the right decisions and be proactive. It helps to be more consistent um, in the manufacturing process. There's less batch to batch variability. There's a greater batch to batch consistency. It's, it's a tool and it's maybe an indirect benefit, but it really derives an engagement and collaboration between the different functions. It's the, it's operation quality engineering, MSNT, PDA, you name it. It is really an engagement tool. It brings us together and, and this cross-functional discussion, this cross-functional alignment is really the one of the key driver how QBD has to be implemented and how it will be successful. And last but not least, because you understand your process, you because you have this pro proactive thinking of this proactive approach, it really drives for us as, as a CDMO, it drives flexibility. And because we, we're thinking ahead and with, because of the collaboration, we really have, I think, uh, the maximum flexibility which we can wish in the current facility, the new facility, and it really helps to 
to serve our patients, going back to our vision mission statement of the name of, of Andalin, which is Andrew and Evelyn. So with that said, um, I give it back to Michael. All right, well, thank you. That was really excellent. I really appreciate the way the three of you work together and kind of the logical approach to tying in process development to facility design and through to validation. That's really what, what uh, QBD is all about. We have time just for uh, maybe two quick questions. Uh, the first one is about when you start QBD and I'll just, without calling out the questioner by name, I'll say, if you read aging, you would know the answer to this question, but uh, I, I, will, I will ask it anyway, so the presenters can give their, their view. Uh, in line with phase appropriate clinical development, where does QBD based drug product process development fit in? And maybe you can reflect on this from a facility design standpoint too. Does it begin at the beginning of phase one, end of phase one, phase two, or, or, or later? I'll let Samir answer this question. Uh, okay, I, I would always say, and we always think the earlier you start, the better it is. So, so the example that we gave was we developed a suspension platform. We developed from scratch. We wanted it to be suitable for all phases. So we use that design. It helps us, as you know, it helps us uh, have a good idea of the control points early on in stage. So that's my answer. Earlier you start, the better it is. Of course, uh, as the technology improves, things change, there is scope for improvement. Um, so let's, can you want to add something to that? No, I think Samir, you're absolutely right. We, we, we often, during our initial discussions with a new client, we, 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 we recommend to do a yield assessment or to a simple, you know, a DOE studies for, for their specific serotype and their specific plasmid. So it really starts with, with a phase one, um, with a phase one client. It doesn't have to go all the, all the ways, like for a late stage a client, which has a BLA submission, you know, coming in the future, this requires more time, more, you know, more money, more energy, but to understand, you know, how it works in the small scale and then with our experience and with our, okay, we know this serotype, we get this result, we have this, this legacy, this history, this data mining, this, this outcome, we can really predict how it will then react and how it will um, will produce the, the virus and then in large scale. It, I would say, Michael, as soon you can, as early you can, it's really uh, goes back to the facility part. If you if you build a house and you should suddenly need a new roof, uh, you know, that needs time and money. So, but if you're early enough involved, the, the, the faster, the better, the less resources you will spend. Right, so, so the, the, the engineering SMEs know the right questions to ask, and when to ask those questions that will lead the uh, engineering uh, and architectural firm, uh, you know, down the right path for, uh, you know, creating the design and the design documents. Uh, you know, that early engagement from engineering, from, from SMEs that understand, uh, you know, what it takes to, to not only build, but to operate the facility uh, is, is critically important, um, you know, so, you know, the intent is to build a facility that's going to last a long time. It's going to be robust. It's not going to, you know, have breakdowns, but you have to think about that and plan for that uh, in the beginning. So it starts early. Thanks. Great, great answers and, and, and very consistent with the philosophy that's described in aging. Uh, one more quick question uh, from the audience. How do you build in performance qualification recipes or protocols on equipment when process development is still ongoing? I mean, it, it, Sarah, you'll have to take that. You know, <laughs> I don't think you can, right? So, you know, PQ, you know, when you know the process, you can, you know, run PQ. So we, we take our equipment typically through OQ and depending on, you know, what the clients, you know, what the operations are, then we'll, we'll, we'll do a PQ on, on equipment, but go ahead, Cyril. Yeah, I think it's, it, it really depends a little bit what your, what kind of equipment we talk on, which kind of platform, if you have an, I would say, um, a classical interim platform, that the process itself is 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 really it's 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 more manual. You the, the the equipment is slightly you know 
it's not so advanced but when you go to an isolus or a, 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 a bioreactor we we really start with with the with the whole process so you have you do a, a factor acceptance test you do a site acceptance test and then you do the iqoq and then what you do as part of the equipment you you do a pq and for for example what you can do with what you can do with a with a bioreactor you really simulate a, a full run not with media and cells you can use water to really really demonstrate that the equipment can perform over the certain time frame as required however with that said either going back to the initial thought and approach we have here at Andalin, we test this kind of activities from a PQ standpoint way early before we have the equipment on site. Because again, when it's on site, it's on site. You have you can normally not do a lot. So we do all the critical tests uh, on a, again on a on a bioreactors, you know, mixing, heating, cooling, you know, where you really get into all the nitty-gritty details. We do that as part of the factor acceptance test. And then we get to a point. When you have for the we for the filling line, which is a part of the new of the new building, we will do a PQ and the PQ there will have several factors for the new filling line. It will be part, of course, a PQ, the classical PQ will be, you know, performance of the of the filling. Can you uh, regularly or you have a robust fill process that you get your 1.5 milliliter in, in the wild consistently over a whole batch where you have all the statistics. And then, of course, you have an aseptic process simulation, which is kind of the cherry on the cake from a, from a PQ standpoint, where you do, where you test your, the, the whole ecosystem of, of a filling operation or aseptic operation, where you test the operator, you have your VHP cycle, the monitoring, how the equipment comes in, how the, how the primary packaging components come in. So where you really test everything. But again, a PQ is just, a combination of all the little IQ OQ parts, which you have to do, um, you know, you have to verify and test that before you go in the PQ because performance qualification is just putting everything together. Great. Thanks. Great, great answers to those questions. And uh, need to move on to the next uh, presentation, but thanks to the three of you. Uh, really, really well done. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you. How about, so much you know, for taking shout out time. what's going on in Columbus, Ohio? Uh, really impressive. Uh, go Buckeyes. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, our next presentation is from Ken Foreman at IDBS. Ken, apologies that we ran into your time a little bit. If you need some more time at the end, I'll, I will shorten up my closing uh, remarks. I'm sure people would rather hear what you have to say. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ken, uh, so quick, quick uh, by way of introduction, Ken has over 28 years of experience and expertise in IT operations and product and project management, uh, focused on pharmaceutical and software development I'm sorry, software development in the pharmaceutical space. Uh, Ken, uh, in his previous role, was director of project management, NAM at Bayovia Desalt Systems, and held multiple director positions at Aegis Analytical. Uh, he was the director of IT at Rally Software Development, uh, director of commercial operations at Fisher Imaging, and director of IT at Allos Therapeutics and Genomica. Uh, in addition to his work accomplishments, and Ken, I'm going to ask you to explain this before the start of your presentation. Ken is a certified scrum master. <laughs> he holds a BSc in computer science from Cal Poly and an MBA from University of Colorado Denver. Scrum, is that a rugby reference? That's an agile software reference for uh, okay. <laughs> world, being agile. Okay. <laughs> That's a whole different presentation. We don't want to go down that today. All but right. uh, can you hear me okay? It's all good? Uh, yes, go ahead. All right. Um, so first off, uh, let me share my screen and make sure that this is all working properly. And hopefully, is my presentation being shared properly? Uh, I can see it. Yes. Great. Um, so uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, and what a, what a great segue from the, the team at Andalin. Uh, Cyril, uh, what a, it just, I think, teed it up beautifully for me uh, with some of the notes he had around the importance of tech transfer coming out of your QBD efforts. 
And um, really what my focus on today here is approaching that tech transfer initiative of taking all of your efforts out of your QBD that we've heard about from uh, the different presentations today, um, and really making sure that you optimize your tech transfer uh, capabilities and processes, uh, as well as just your interrelationships with your partners uh, through a digital transformation. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna focus on that. Uh, as Michael said, I'm Ken Foreman, Senior Director of Product Strategy for IDBS. At IDBS, uh, we offer software solutions that help streamline your product and process data management throughout the biopharma lifecycle. And we'll be talking a little bit more about the, that biopharma lifecycle in this presentation. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody from my mountain colorful Colorado. I hope it's a pleasant day wherever you may be. Um, and I'm, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm going to be sharing some, some digital strategies really about what comes next in that tech transfer from the outcomes of your QBD activities into the manufacturing arena. And that's regardless of whether they're captive or outsourced to a CMO, or if you are a sponsor or a CMO, um, we're hoping that um, what the different strategies and uh, things we're going to talk about today apply to both sides of the equation. So our focus uh, today will really be on three primary areas. The first being uh, approaches for transforming your business around tech transfer, uh, moving from what for many companies today is a manual approach uh, or a semi-automated approach to really a fully automated digital solution. And some thoughts about that you need to consider as you want to make that transformation. Second, putting some context around this, uh, this new term that we'll be talking about called a digital data backbone, or you may have heard it called a digital thread, um, digital spine, but many of you have probably heard IT people talking about these things. And we're gonna put a little bit of context around that. Uh, and how, does it, how is that important to you in the world of tech transfer for gene therapy? And then we'll wrap up with a brief review of you know, the interactions of a sponsor and a CMO as you, as you go through a digital transformation. Um, I'm gonna to try to remain agnostic about whether you are a sponsor or you're a CMO or CDMO, um, like uh, we just heard from, because really both sides, both partners in that equation face a lot of the same challenges. Um, and the final note is, as we go through these different topics, I do want to stress, um, you know, there's really four key areas of importance, and, and I think you'll hear these as a theme, and I always just like to plant the seed, but be listening for challenges and suggestions and, and benefits around the people in your organization that we've heard today, you know, how critical it is to be considering your, your own staffing and resources the processes that you follow, the data that you're trying to manage and, and how you move your data, excuse me, around your organization. And finally, what technologies are you employing to do all of this? Um, whether or not it's all native systems, if you're moving into the cloud and who's helping you to do that. So let's, let's start with, um, you know, gene therapy tech transfer. Tech transfer is, it's not going to be new for most, if not all of you, but I think we want to call out the fact that for gene therapy there, and, and other new cell therapies as well, there are definitely new challenges that are being raised. Um, so let's look at a few of these challenges specific to tech transfer in your organization for these new modalities, be it gene or cell therapy approaches. Um, starting with the fact that, you know, we are talking about these new and evolving modalities, um, key being evolving. I mean, how fast are these um, modalities changing and new ones are seem to be uh, cropping up constantly. Um, and of course, recognizing that for allogeneic versus autologous approaches, uh, they, you know, autologous approaches do have some unique challenges of their own as well, owing to the fact that uh, those therapies literally need to track an individual's own cells from, you know, creating what we call a, a manufacturing batch size of one um, in combination with some really complex manufacturing steps. Um, last thing we'd ever want to do is leave people thinking, you know, this is really easy. Uh, it's not. This is complex and hard. And uh, that's what makes it so special. Um, we uh, also want to identify the fact that, you know, I think 
I, 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 everyone I've spoken to has recognized the skilled labor shortages that are going on in the industry, uh, how hard it is to find really good people and attract them. Uh, we're all competing for a lot of these same resources. Uh, and then don't forget to be able to retain them, um, having packages in place and making sure that your science is interesting to them. Um, control of raw materials, uh, the fact that raw material management in the world of gene therapy uh, brings some, some new challenges um, with these new modalities. Uh, environmentally critical supply chain transport. We're talking about patient's blood now and, and um, in addition to transport of medicines. So there, there's new vectors, new, new challenges here around the supply chain um, and movement of material. Uh, not to mention the fact that global supply chain, you know, a lot of people are now moving to working with partners and CMOs that might even be on the other side of the pond. And how would you do that when you have really strict timelines and, and environmental uh, requirements for your materials? Always evolving new regulatory approaches, uh, regulatory requirements. Um, and, you know, as, as we all identify the need for speed, um, and the need for speed is everything from the scientific development through um, working with partners through tech transfer and quick setup to be able to manufacture quickly. Uh, and then, of course, the speed for delivery of, of therapies to the patient. Um, and then finally, just recognizing that, you know, digital maturity, your digital maturity actually can become a risk assessment item. Um, you know, as, as you're moving into really complex manufacturing processes, uh, how risky is it if everything you do is on paper and, you know, being able to find things and, and quickly uh, identify issues or problems. So uh, for anyone new to tech transfer, just a quick reminder of the primary goal as stated by the World Health Organization here. Um, you know, the goal of tech transfer activities is to transfer product and process knowledge between development and manufacturing and within or between manufacturing sites to achieve product realization. And then key here, this knowledge forms the basis for the manufacturing process, control strategy, process validation approach, as we just heard about, and ongoing continual improvement. So kind of sets the stage for us. So as we move towards looking at the strategy of utilizing a digital data backbone uh, for your digital transformation, whether you're a gene therapy company or a CMO doing the manufacturing, let's first identify, identify the challenges that we face. So we'll start with that. And then recognizing that those challenges have a large cost to your business to overcome in time and effort of your critical people assets, um, both on the IT side, as well as scientific and engineering resources. Noting the changes to your processes will impact your quality organization, requiring documentation, new validation, qualifications. Um, it'll be adding risks to your data integrity. It always does, anytime you touch your data. And investing in technology and services to affect your transformation, of course, requires investment um, that might otherwise go into core development. Um, so, We'll also, we'll, after we look at the challenges, we'll wanna focus on, well, what are those benef business benefits of, of making all of these investments in your, your digital transformation? So, as I said, let's, let's start with just, you know, putting the challenges on the table. Um, the digital maturity of your organization is, is always just the starting point. Um, you know, we've heard from some small companies, there's startups, even more mature organizations who are finding that while they theoretically were digitally mature a few years ago, they're finding their digital platforms and architectures they built over the years are becoming obsolete. Large in-house data centers, um, old languages, old systems. And you know, they're, they're struggling to figure out how to move to new technologies, move to the cloud, take advantage of new applications that are available from third-party vendors and how to integrate them into their environments that might have been uh, entirely custom built. Where do you sit on that maturity scale? Um, IT culture of build in-house uh, versus buying outsourced. 
uh, if you want to build everything in house, that that comes with a cost in time. You've got a resource to build things, um, and then always remember once you build it, you have to be able to maintain it uh, and support it for years to come. Uh, management support to commit resources is critical uh, and can be a challenge uh, in some organizations for companies that where the management is convinced that every dollar needs to go into the development cycles in the science. Um, and I'm not saying that's not critically important, but you've got to be able to find the funding for something like a digital transformation. Large legacy on-prem investment, as I mentioned earlier, um, often there are security concerns. Now, most security concerns can be dealt with and addressed, um, but they do need to, you know, they are challenges that will need to be addressed. Compliance and validation mind shift um, from old style validation requirements to being open-minded to things like cloud-based hosted applications and how those are actually now becoming part of the standard in the industry. Um, even the FDA is using some cloud-based apps, so they're, they're open to this. Um, cloud IT skills and knowledge itself. Hiring skilled cloud people is really hard, um, really hard to find. It's very expensive. Um, and getting it in-house and, and applied to your business is a challenge. And you want to get an early start on that if, as, as you move down this, this digital path. Change control processes, of course, are always um, can be a challenge depending on how much overhead you have in place. And then, of course, your supply chain um, access integration of your supply chain into your digital platform. Um, you know, you, you need to be working with your partners. How can you optimize their integration with the work you're doing? But now that we identified some of those challenges, and I, I mentioned that, you know, obviously there's extreme costs to being able to address those, there are real business benefits to taking them on. And this is just to name a few. Uh, collaborative approach to tech transfer um, can really improve the speed and accuracy of transferring your process control strategies. Uh, you know, today, uh, often, most likely, it's on paper and requires extensive meetings and uh, information going back and forth between either your internal organizations or your, your external partners. Uh, and putting digital processes in place can help. Digital tooling can, can uh, greatly improve collaboration. Partner network data feeds. Um, really getting that data back from your partners Again, as I mentioned, it's likely all paper records, batch records, et cetera, paper reports coming back from your CMOs, as an example. Uh, this can be really slow, cumbersome, problematic, and it's probably tied to legal agreements that you set possibly even years ago. Um, and we'll be talking about that in the collaboration piece at the, uh, at, in, uh, in a little bit. Global unified access to batch data is really improved through um, you know, CMO direct data, uh, ent direct entry of data, excuse me, be that manual or if they're uploading data or maybe even integration with some of their systems. Um, I will say right now that you know, most CMOs and CDMOs will not give you direct access to say a LIM system or uh, a Pi system as an example, because they have data for other customers in there as well, um, but they can create Extracts and you know getting system integration capabilities are are being pursued uh, by many of our customers, as an example at IDBS. Uh, investigations can be accelerated through the quick availability of needed data, and we all know the importance of getting through investigations quickly. Uh, for process monitoring as well, uh, CPV trending can be changed uh, to monitor by exception where you focus on the problems and really solving those problems or you impending, you see trends going out of trend, you wanna attack before they become problems and you're not wasting time gathering data and, and or generating needless reports, um, really focused on, on solving issues. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, let's consider the business impacts of these benefits. You know, you've got faster availability of therapies to your patients higher quality of drug product, potentially yielding even improved efficacy of those therapies, and downstream cost savings by eliminating that wasted time and effort and improving your supply chain relationships. Now here, we, we see some examples on the right here of, um, these are actually some of our own uh, Skyland PIMS sample outputs, uh, allowing a sponsor to monitor similar critical quality attributes from two different CMOs. 
um, something that being done on on paper and and manually, you might have different people managing different CMOs and and they may never even be able to share the data or doing so is quite extensive effort. Um, being able to just bring that up on your one screen becomes quite advantageous um, for supply chain management. And note, um, you additionally gain the benefit, as we see on the left side here, providing new insights from the manufacturing floor back to your process development engineers, providing a pretty very valuable feedback loop on the, uh, the success of your uh, control strategies. And we'll be talking about this more in, in, in a minute. So we've seen some of the challenges in the world of gene therapy tech transfer, digital transformations, uh, as well as several of the key benefits for taking on those challenges. Um, now we're gonna move into really our key suggested strategy of applying this digital data backbone to the, this component of your data architecture. So let's start with um, biopharma lifecycle management. Um, you already do this. Uh, we just put a name to it. This is the uh, drug product life cycle from R&D through PD, tech transfer, manufacturing, and onto your patients, of course. Um, so again, I, while this may be a new term, BPLM, you'll hear me call it, uh, we at IDBS like to call it. Um, I, I do wanna stress, this is an activity that everybody is already performing. Uh, and what we see on this slide is how your life cycle is really fed at the bottom um, by many different systems in your organization. If you look at the bottom of your slide here, multiple different technology platform layers. Uh, this is just a sampling of some of those data sources. For example, you've got low level data generated directly by bench equipment um, on up to industrial sized bioreactors and filtration systems. Um, you have manufacturing data management systems like LIMS for sample management, um, PIMS from Skyland, um, MES systems for batches control and management, on up to business systems like ERP and ERP data is being supplied. Um, and of course, you've even got paper and Excel spreadsheets. Um, we'll never, you know, I, I've yet to find a company that's 100% gotten rid of those. If you are, raise your hand. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, and all of these data sources really feed what, you know, we call your data backbone. Um, and this is specific to the data backbone for your BPLM. Uh, this traverses the entire product lifecycle, providing a platform for uh, really for harmonizing the data and making it available for review, analysis, investigations, and regulatory reporting all the way across that lifecycle. Um, the yellow arrows that I brought up there, you know, once again reiterate that feedback loop I previously mentioned there. Um, it provides additional insights whether you're looking at the data coming from upstream or how the data is performing, you know, the, how the process that was designed with your QBD, how well is that performing downstream? Uh, do you need to make changes to it? Or maybe you can even make changes to your QBD models that you've got for, um, for the next molecule or the next uh, drug that you plan to work on. Um, that, the importance of that cycle can't be um, minimized there. IDBS's approach to managing this life cycle, as you, you can see on the slide, is via what we call our Polar platform, as well as the Skyland PIMS product, um, Polar being more on the upstream and Skyland PIMS on the, the downstream manufacturing um, and tying together uh, the data through the tech transfer process. So key to the data challenges, um, you know, these are challenges, again, I think we all face. Uh, but they're explicitly addressed through the implementation of that digital data backbone we just spoke about. So you'll likely end up with, you know, a network of backbones. Uh, I, I want to be real clear here. I'm not advocating uh, a single back, you know, enterprise-wide backbone um, that your life cycle is going to manage for your entire company, all of your financial side, all of your commercial side. Um, I, I, I'm from the school of thought, you're gonna end up with a network of backbones and you will need to be able to exchange information across those backbones. Uh, but that helps minimize risk and it allows you to really optimize each of those um, business areas by having a backbone that's appropriate for that area. 
Um, and that's also a, one way of cleaning up our earlier diagram with regards to those data sources. Imagine that we would simply reply, replace all those data sources with an architecture diagram connecting data backbones. Uh, much simpler architecture and, and it really optimizes uh, integration capabilities that IT experts are good at. Um, and having one for your bio, you know, a backbone for your biopharma product lifecycle management is really key to moving data across your, your digital architecture. Um, note that utilizing the cloud can assist with several of these challenges, like geo dispersed data silos, um, you know, being able to move data across, um, as well as global access to the data. IT bottlenecks can be reduced by outsourcing key solutions to vendors like IDBS, but uh, allowing your IT to focus on business continuity and support. Uh, and note that a well-designed data backbone really uh, takes security and integrations into account from right from the beginning. Um, they provide a quick time to value, uh, very important on the commercial side of the house, uh, making sure that all of your investments are, are returning a quick time to value, you know, making sure you're getting money back out of that investment. Um, not just overall ROI, but how quickly are you seeing some of that return coming to you? Uh, as well as it's an earlier mechanism for harmonization and improved downstream transparency. So some considerations to keep in mind as you lay out your, your strategy. Um, you know, persistence assured with data availability and a sound backup strategy right from the beginning. Um, data integrity is, is really key, of course. Um, having a dynamic design, ability to change quickly for today's fast moving business environment, and new modalities that are coming out. Uh, don't lock yourself into what you're making today when uh, you may be making something new and exciting tomorrow. Um, a scalable approach. Uh, the ability to what we call auto scale to eliminate, eliminate compute bottlenecks. This is something that's really, really a, a strong power of the cloud. Um, you know, if you've got systems that you're starting to stress, uh, cloud technologies operate this auto scaling. Well, they add CPU and, and, and memory and disk automatically on the fly without any human interaction as it's needed. It's, it's an incredible technology that um, building into your, your strategy can really save a lot of time, headache, um, and, and investment because you only pay for it when it's needed. Um, digital maturity with integrations. Um, you know, how, how mature is your integration structure? Do you have APIs in place? Do you have the skills for integrating uh, other tools? Um, you wanna make sure that it's a performant, proven solution. Uh, compute network speeds uh, to you know be able to do speed analysis and um, storage requirements. Now storage every year gets cheaper. Uh, most companies are finding that, uh, with the exception of a few firms that are pursuing big data initiatives, you know storage is so cheap that it's it's really more of an issue of um, the backups and data integrity in the storage. Um, Security, CAIQ, CAIQ, SOC 2 testing, um, audits, uh, penetration tests, other standards now exist to help mitigate security concerns. Uh, your IT team, I'm sure, knows all about that. Uh, compliance as well, backbone architecture should be easy and fast to validate, um, and of course, maintain for GXP compliance. And uh, innovation capabilities, how to, how to integrate things like artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, especially on the front end of that equation with um, of your science uh, to enhance discovery, improve control. And we're, we're now starting to see it uh, utilized downstream in um, PD and, and even into manufacturing um, as well, speed investigations as an, as an example. So that gets us through two of our three topics. Let's, let's move, move to our final topic of the, the sponsor CMO. Uh, partnerships and relationships and how they fit into our discussion of tech transfer for gene therapy. Uh, but I always like to start with my favorite quote um, provided by our friends at Accenture, um, right out of the uh, publication that they presented, um, collaboration between manufacturers and partners is beset by inefficient manual processes. I see heads shaking up and down. A lack of standardization and poor visibility into manufacturing operations. Simply put, 
This can't provide the agility and efficiency needed to manage an ever more complex life sciences supply chain. This is um, actually from 2019. And I, it's funny, I think every year, this last part of the sentence about ever more complex life sciences supply chain is, uh, is, is increasing in complexity. So um, some of the data sharing challenges between the uh, sponsors and CMOs, again, I, I probably am not telling you anything you don't already know, but encapsulating this on a single slide of, of just some of those challenges, some of the key challenges, um, is, you know, the legal agreements, as we mentioned, that have been in place, uh, often um, recrafting legal agreements to be able to work together on a more digital framework, um, it takes time uh, and, and involves the legal uh, departments and you'll want to start early on that um, cost versus revenue and what we mean there is <clears throat> are you burying uh, additional investment in digital transformation into the cost of doing business or do you see it as an opportunity to pass those costs on and maybe maybe even add on a little bit extra and turn it into a revenue uh, um, stream for your organization um, harmonization and ontologies is, of course, a challenge right when you think you've got it handled because you work through all of your data harmonization with, with your core sponsor or your core CMO, bring in the next customer, next partner um, with new ontologies, um, and you get to start again. I think we're starting to see a little more global harmonization um, around terminology and ontologies, and I think that's going to continue as, as this, this global framework and everybody starts working together. Um, but these are definitely challenges for managing your data. Um, ownership versus stewardship, a reminder of who owns the data, the sponsor at the end of the day. Um, but any point in the process that data may be generated by a CMO and who's responsible for, for the quality of that data um, and maintaining that. Achieving a shared quality culture. While everybody sets up to the table and says, of course, we have a quality culture. Um, there's differences in how they achieve that um, and aligning on uh, and gaining agreement on how to uh, what we call a, a, a combined quality culture. Um, how do you get there? Um, and then, of course, creating a partner mentality, overcome that fear of oversharing. Uh, so many times we hear people who are, are worried about their partner seeing something they shouldn't have seen. Um, and, you know, Achieve, getting to a relationship where it's a collaboration and you're working together when you see problematic data um, to get ahead of, of qual potential quality concerns as opposed to trying to hide that and solve it on your own really points to achieving a full partnership. Um, you know, what, what I call reaching a collaboration that yields data visibility, faster tech transfer, lower supply chain costs, and higher product quality. The key here is to not let a partner relationship challenge, you know, impact the quality or timeliness of what we all want to deliver to our patients. So some of the um, data sharing for tech transfer um, topics here, uh, just some reminders, CMO sy systems are multi-customer, as I mentioned earlier. So uh, keep that in mind, asking for access to a limb system is not always going to be easy, you know, but asking for an extract of that data that might be reasonable. Um, and remember your CMOs hate paperwork too. So getting everybody off of paper is, is really a win-win and, and, and jives into that win-win opportunity. Um, both sides of the equation are, are suffering from the same resource challenges that we all suffer. Um, sometimes we can help each other there. Um, you know, Bring that to the table. How can we help each other through resource challenges? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, <laughs> data stewardship versus data owner. Uh, at any point in time, a CMO may be your data steward. We all have the same goal, speeding that tech, tech transfer process. Um, we don't want to rush it. If we rush it, cut corners, mistakes happen, um, but we can absolutely speed it up through uh, digital transformation. Um, so remember, it does take time. And then, of course, don't forget the legal. So let me wrap up with um, you know key takeaways here. Digital transformation is now, it's happening. Um, there are partners available to help you if your team is struggling with it. Uh, biopharma lifecycle management, we're all doing it and it benefits from a digital data backbone. And the tech, technology and digital transformation can improve your sponsor CMO collaboration for optimal tech transfer. 
So with that, I don't know. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Michael. I don't know if we did get any questions um, specific to uh, my presentation. Questions for Ken. Probably. Right, we may have a little end of the day. Fatigue, but certainly, um, if you have follow up questions, uh, we you can let us know and uh, either through the member portal or email me and we'll make sure to pass those along to Ken. Hopefully, everybody has gotten appreciation now of the, the importance of getting away from paper uh, and, and, you know, the importance of data management. Uh, Ken, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and I just want to, uh, uh, in, in closing today, a few brief remarks. Thank all of the participants for today for uh, all, all the work you did in preparing for this and those great presentations. Uh, I want to thank everyone who took the time to attend. Hopefully, you found this to be informative. Uh, again, we will post the recording uh, when it's ready in the next few days or so to ARM's website. Um, around that same time, we'll send out a survey. Please answer it. Love to have feedback. Uh, any feedback is appreciated. Um, as, as far as presentations go, where we have permission to share them, we'll post those on the member portal, or uh, if, if uh, the presenters have, some have uh, asked that you directly contact them, we'll post that contact information on the member portal as well. If, if you're an R member, you have access to the member portal via committee participation. So all you need to do is join a committee, and I would encourage you to do that. The committees I lead are science and technology and reg CMC. Even if you can't make those committee meetings, even if you can't make them ever, you can join that uh, that committee uh, again, S and T or Reg CMC, and it will give you access to that community and the member portal. And we use that as a communication thread to post a lot of useful information, uh, including from workshops like this one. Uh, any questions about how to get onto the portal? You can email me or email the committee administrator Tommy Zabo at ARM. Uh, and and with that, I thank you all again for your participation and attention. And I wish everyone, depending on where you are, a, a great rest of your day or a great evening. Take care. Now.